Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining the meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Welcome, uh, council and board members. Uh, in the mode of life always goes on and there's changes. Um, first off, I'd like to recognize Gary Buser. Gary's term is ending, so this will be the last meeting he'll be attending uh, with us. And we very much appreciate Gary's uh, insights, engagement, uh, always a very active member uh, with FACEAC and, and we will miss him. Uh, but also I have the opportunity to introduce Joyce Joseph, uh, first time attending the FACEAC meeting. She's the incoming FASB board member. Her term starts officially July 1, but she's been actively engaged already. And uh, Joyce, we look forward to uh, seeing you. If you should read her bio. She's uh, well-rounded from an auditor to a preparer to an investor, even getting her PhD. So I guess we checked the academic box as well. So <laughs> it's great to have her aboard. So thank you. Um, and then there's some others attending FACEAC for the first time. Uh, from the PCAOB, we have Dima Andrico, Deputy Chief Auditor, Auditor, and also we have Diane Norton, uh, FAF trustee, is observing the meeting this morning. So thanks, Diane. It's great to have you. Um, later today, there's going to be a small number of faculty members who will be joining us and including for the breakouts. Uh, this is a program that takes place every year. They come from schools from various parts of the country, and they're part of the summer faculty program where they're interested in conducting research on financial reported issues that are relevant to the FASB. So they come in here and get a, uh, a deep dive on a variety of topics and uh, including observing our meetings. So um, they'll be in your meetings and uh, hopefully they learn a thing or two from that. So we'll help them at their research. Uh, just some of uh, the housekeeping rules, although I think we're getting pretty good at this mixed format of meetings. Um, but for those of you uh, that are in person here, um, if you have a question, turn your card on your side. If it's uh, on point for a topic that's at hand, use raise, raise your hand so we'll know to follow up with you a little quicker on that front. Those of you at home uh, can use the uh, raise hand feature um, on the Zoom. Uh, and then when you've been called on to speak here in the room, just a reminder to press that button. And then when you're done, more importantly, to press the button again. Uh, so it uh, helps in terms of the Zoom feed and where the cameras are faced. So um, why don't we start with introductions, just to go around the table, and then we'll do the online as well. So uh, Mike Morrow, FACEAC Chair. I am Mike Berryman. I'm a member of the FASB staff, a practice fellow uh, from Ernst & Young. Hi, good morning. I'm Lauren Motley. I'm one of the FASB staff. Good morning, Mary Mazzala, FASB staff, assistant director. Jeremy Croucher, KPMG. Hi, I'm Ted Christensen. I'm a faculty member at the University of Georgia. And David Gonzalez, Moody's. Liz Hall, Mars Incorporated. Tony Yanez, Wilkie Farr. Jonathan News, Alvarez, and Marcel. Fred Cannon, FASB board member. Dan Murdoch, Comcast Corporation. Laura Long, Agco Corporation. Basu Goval, Equity Research Analyst at KBW. Debbie Dial, former AT&T. Deanne Bruns, um, retired CFO, public company board member. John Balagpar, Citigroup. Bob Dacey, U.S. Government Accountability Office. Brian Bloom, representing the AICPA. Nellie Debler, I'm the FASB Deputy Technical Director. Saul Martinez, Equity Research Analyst at HSBC. Rich Jones, FASB Chair. Kathy Gill Charest, Paramount Global. Tom Barbieri, PwC. Paul Beswick, Ernst & Young. Monica Losman, Gibson Dunn. Joyce Joseph, incoming FASB member. Shweepa Joshi, S&P Global Ratings. Howard Guild, Slumma J Limited. Bird Fox, Grant Thornton. Steve Rivera, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Todd Castagna Research, Morgan Stanley. Uh, Richard Sloan, University of Southern California. Lisa Kuntz, Lisa Kuntz, faculty member, University of Texas. Yen Zhang, Eisner Amber. Christine Bodison, FASB member. Jonathan Wiggins, Securities and Exchange Commission. Hilary Salo, FASB Technical Director. Marsha Hunt, FASB Board Member. 
Alicia Manders, FASB staff. And now let's do some of the virtual participants. I'll call you in no particular order, so you have to be on your toes. Uh, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Karbowski, Netflix. Dory. YMCA well, Metropolitan Chicago and corporate board member. Great. Andrew. Andrew Skadoff, Chief Investment Officer at Bank Creek Capital Manager. JW. J.W. Verrett, Professor at George Mason Law School. Greg. Greg Waxman, Portfolio Manager and Equity Research Analyst at Voya Investment Management. Dima. Dima Andrew Yanko, PCOB Deputy Chief Auditor. Diane. A Diane Norton, FAF board member, former Wellington Management and CFA Chair. Mr. Buser. Gary Buser, FASB. Thank you. And Jeff Brickman. Jeff Brickman, Senior Investor Liaison. Great. Okay. Thank you. So we have three topics on our agenda today. Um, We'll start with highlights from and hot topics from the FASB, SEC, and PCAOB. Then the first topic will be an update on segment reporting. Um, we'll get an update on where the project stands. Before lunch, we'll begin our second topic, which is accounting and disclosure of software costs. And that will be uh, the fuel, if you will, for the breakout sessions. Then we'll have lunch, reconvene at one o'clock to resume that discussion, um, then conclude with an update on select FASB projects. I think we did this six months ago or so, and it was well received. So we thought we'd uh, get a little bit more of a um, routine going on that because I think it's help helpful. Uh, just a reminder, when discussing topics, please refrain from referencing specific companies during the public session. Uh, administratively, Roseanne Plank is available throughout the day to help with any additional logistical information, messages, transportation arrangements, etc. So uh, why don't I turn it over to the FASB chair, Rich Jones, and he'll give us a highlight on recent FASB activities. Great, Mike. Thanks very much. And, and thanks, everyone, for, for spending time with us today. I, I recognize you're all busy, but it's an important part of our process, and we greatly appreciate you doing it. And we definitely have a full table, so it's, it's good to see all of you. Uh, so since our last meeting, we've continued to make progress on our agenda here in 2023, and we were benefiting from the outreach scoping and path forward that was set under our agenda outreach project. So summary of some of the things that we've accomplished, we've issued final standards on accounting for investments and tax credit structures, as well as accounting for leases between entities under common control. We've issued EDs on accounting for profits interest awards, as well as an ED on improvements to income tax disclosures, whose comment period closed just recently, and, accounting, and an ED on accounting for and disclosure of crypto assets, whose comment period closes today. So if you haven't gotten your comment letter in, you still have time. Uh, we expect to issue a final standard on joint venture formations early in the third quarter. And we also expect to issue EDs on disaggregation of income statement expenses toward the end of the second quarter, beginning in the third quarter as well as accounting for acquired financial assets with that same timing, likely the beginning of the third quarter. So the progress on our agenda, I would say, is in response to the extensive stakeholder input we've gotten throughout this process, meaning with you, as well as our extensive agenda uh, outreach approach. Um, our post-implementation reviews of our leasing, RevRec, and CECL standards are ongoing. Um, you can see the status of those post-implementation reviews, as well as different things that we've accomplished on our website. It's fully published under a section on post-implementation reviews. A um, couple things I wanted to point out. I would, would like to point out that this year's print edition of the codification will be our final print edition. So if you are a collector of print editions of the codification, this is your last chance. And it does say on it, final print edition. So please go with that. Uh, but we and, and the, the FAF uh, Foundation thought this was the right time to transition from print to our fully electronic version. We've released an improved, free, fully electronic version, and it seemed like the right time to make that change. So those collectors, don't, don't be shy. There's not that many of them. So and, and, and I would also like to take this as an opportunity to congratulate Mike on his reappointment as Face Act Chair. Uh, Mike, we couldn't do it without you. Thanks very much, and we look forward to keeping you on these next few years. So. Thank you. It's an with honor to work with questions. all of you. It's, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, Mike, happy to take any questions.
Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Wiggins. It's great to see you here and in person and uh, update on the SEC activities. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's fantastic to be here today. Looking forward to the, the dialogue around some very important topics. Um, just to, uh, as a reminder, any remarks that I make today are uh, provided in my official capacity as part of uh, the Commission's Office of the Chief Accountant. Don't uh, necessarily reflect the views of the uh, commissioners, the commission, or uh, no, other members of the SEC staff. So uh, I'll start with uh, just a few brief updates on personnel, uh, both in April. Uh, one is that we uh, just had Gaurav Haranandani join the office of the chief accountant uh, as a senior associate chief accountant. Many of you uh, had the opportunity to work with Kevin Vaughn over the years. Uh, Gaurav has taken Kevin's spot. And so we're very happy to have him join us uh, and, and getting up to speed very quickly. And then also in April, uh, I was uh, appointed as the deputy chief accountant over the accounting group in, the, in OCA. So uh, also very honored. Uh, to uh, serve in that capacity and, and looking forward to that. Um, as far as commission uh, updates, uh, in May, the commission adopted amendments to uh, the disclosure requirements related to repurchases of a, an issuer's equity securities. Uh, and then uh, related to the commission's December final rule on uh, 10B51 insider trading plans uh, and other disclosures. The Division of Corporation Finance just posted three new C and DIs or uh, compliance and disclosure interpretations in late May related to that rulemaking, including uh, some details about implementation timeline for certain disclosures. Um, as far as uh, areas of focus in the Office of the Chief Accountant recently, uh, uh, we have a consultation process through which we address emerging uh, novel, unique uh, fact patterns from a technical accounting perspective. That volume continues to be fairly elevated, uh, but, but most of the issues that we see are rather unique. Uh, anytime that there are uh, trends, we tend to try to communicate those uh, through meetings like this or uh, announcements or, or, uh, or, or written statements uh, like we did last year related to crypto lending. So we have seen a continued volume of crypto consultations, but most of those have been one-off issues um, unrelated to the uh, work that the uh, FASB is currently doing on crypto, uh, but uh, things related to uh, crypto lending, implementation of our SAV 121 on um, uh, uh, safeguarding obligations and, and other fairly unique fact patterns. We continue to see issues related to the SPAC transactions. Those have shifted more uh, to questions that we're getting from the Division of Corporation Finances reviews primarily especially related to DSPAC mergers. Uh, so questions related to earn out arrangements or, or other very unique fact patterns. Uh, and then I would say anytime we've provided these updates, usually revenue has been the number one area of, of consultation for our office. Uh, that has decreased significantly. It, it still is up uh, near the top, if not the top generally, but as you can expect uh, years after implementation, um, Rich mentioned the, the PIR process. Um, you know, we, we continue to see volume, but most of those are from new registrants, uh, pre-IPO issues where they, they want to uh, consult with us before filing generally, and then one-off issues. But uh, we, we do see uh, a fair number of issues related to principal versus agent and identification performance obligations, especially in very uh, structured industries like uh, managed healthcare payment processors and, and those types of of industries. Um, and then as of late, we've been very focused on, on high quality financial reporting in light of the current environment with concurrent uh, geopolitical and economic shifts. Uh, as, as Paul Munter, our chief accountant and many others from the, the commission have, have said a lot uh, lately, uh, financial reporting is a communication exercise. And when the current environment is shifting significantly, it's really important for uh, uh, registrants and, and, and uh, preparers to think about how to bridge the gap between the historical financial statements and what they expect going forward. And obviously, there are a lot of tools within the financial statements um, related to subsequent events, going concern, uh, disclosures um, that are, are currently being stress tested a, a bit since they were issued by the FASB. And, uh, and 
and then disclosures outside the financial statements as well to, to bridge that gap and, and make sure that investors are getting the information that they need to understand a company's operations in the current environment, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are dealing with right now. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. And congratulations on the official uh, title. Um, any questions for Jonathan? For sure. I just had a quick question. At the last meeting, you, you mentioned the updated CNDIs on Reg G, and in particular, the what's considered misleading. Um, and it seems that you're coming down on cash versus non-cash, cash being misleading, non-cash not being misleading. Whereas users sort of indicate recurring, non-recurring is sort of what they find helpful. Um, and that some of the most misleading emissions of the non-cash ones, like the stock-based comp, and the amortization of intangibles. And I just wondered, you know, it was a, what the reason for heading that direction, the cash non-cash was. Sure, so um, first we're, we're always interested in perspectives like yours on, on what you find misleading or investors find misleading. Um, as far as the, the cash non-cash, uh, I don't know that, that we focused on cash non-cash as much as thinking that uh, a cash operating expense that is part of your core operations, if you remove that cash operating expense, uh, that, that we would find that misleading. Um, but, but I would say more broadly, we're focused on the principle of misleading. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, thanks again. Uh, Dima, update on the PCAOB. Sure, good morning. Before I begin, I need to say also that my remarks, my own views that do not necessarily re reflect the views of the PCB board or staff. I'll talk about, about a few developments related to our public agenda and inspections that have taken place since the last meeting. The last month, we updated our standard setting, research, and rulemaking agenda. As some of you may know, our agenda lists short-term projects. Those where a board action is anticipated in less than 12 months. Mid-term projects, those that are active, but a board action is not anticipated in 12 months. And also research projects. Those projects where the staff is working to determine whether and what type of a regulatory response is needed. Now, some projects, as you may have noticed, like data and technology may be listed as, as research for a while because the subject matter is continuing to evolve. Here's a couple of updates made in this version of the agenda. We updated the status of two projects on quality control and uh, confirmations. Now shows that we anticipate recommending that the board adopt those standards in 2023. We moved our project on substantive analytical procedures from the midterm to short-term agenda. We moved our project on firm and engagement performance metrics from the research to short-term agenda. The metrics project seeks to enhance information provided to investors by auditors at both the firm level and the engagement level. Finally, we um, added our midterm agenda two projects on service organizations and on interim reviews. So it is possible you may see um, advisory group discussions on these topics in the upcoming months. The staff continues to work with the board on all short-term standard setting projects. As you may know, on May 28th, uh, the PCAB proposed a new auditing standard AS1000. It is um, titled General Responsibilities of the Auditor in Conducting an Audit. If adopted, um, this uh, project would reorganize and consolidate a group of interim standards that address uh, core principles and responsibilities of the auditor. Um, on, on that proposal, the, the, the comment period closed on May 30th with uh, 23 comment letters received. Um, the staff is currently considering the comments received and developing recommendations for the board. And as uh, you may have seen in the news, the board is scheduled to hold an open meeting today at uh, 10 a.m. in about uh, 10 minutes to consider issuing for public comment a proposal that is aimed at enhancing investor protection by strengthening requirements for the auditor to identify, evaluate, and communicate possible or actual acts of noncompliance with laws and regulations. Um, 
in addition to the standard setting and research projects, our public agenda now lists rulemaking projects uh, that are focused on enhancing investor transparency and enforcement of PCAB rules. Currently, there are four projects listed on, on that part of the agenda. One considers changes to PCAB rule 3502, responsibility not to knowingly or recklessly contribute to violations. Another project considers uh, changes mainly to PCAB forms two and three that deal with audit firm periodic and special reporting. A third project considers changes uh, to enhance the PCAB's uh, registration program. And a fourth project uh, considers amendments to PCAB rules to provide for expedited follow on disciplinary proceedings against registered firms or associated persons who have been convicted of certain crimes or enjoined or sanctioned by a court or another regulator. Okay, those were some highlights of uh, standard setting and rulemaking. I'll conclude with a quick update on uh, China inspections and a new inspection report format. Uh, last month, uh, we released our first inspection reports on the firms in mainland China and Hong Kong that are inspected in, uh, uh, at the end of 2022. We inspected two audit firms and a total of eight audit engagements. Our chair, Erica Williams, released a statement on May 10th, noting that the two firms inspected audited 40% of the total market share of U.S. listed companies audited by Hong Kong and mainland China firms, and that we're on track to hit 99% of the total market share of those companies by the end of the year. It was also noted that both reports showed unacceptable rates of deficiencies of such significance that PCAB staff believe the engagement team failed to obtain audit evidence sufficient to support the work on the financial statements or on internal control over financial reporting. Finally, a new report format. For those of you who uh, read our inspection reports, you'll notice uh, reports will now include the following additional information that we believe is relevant, reliable, and useful for investors and other users of our inspection reports. There's gonna be a new section that discusses instances of non-compliance with PCAB independence rules and potential non-compliance with US SEC independence rules. There's gonna be more information on risk assessment and fraud-related procedures. Uh, there's gonna be additional commentary in part 1A of the report, uh, such as whether the audit we reviewed was the firm's first audit of that issuer, and whether the areas uh, in which uh, we identified deficiencies were also noted by the firm as having significant risks of material misstatement. And for annual inspected firms, reports will include charts to clearly show firm and engagement um, partner tenure. And one last thing, you may have seen that the PCB Investor Advisory Group is meeting tomorrow beginning at 10, 10 o'clock. The agenda is on our website and some of the topics uh, that are planned to be discussed include uh, critical audit matters and fraud. This is all I plan to cover in, in my update. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dima. Any questions? Thank you. If not, I'll turn it over to Brian Bloom, who's with us today. Welcome, Brian. He's the chair of the peer review board of the AICPA. So Thanks, Mike. Uh, just now. one quick update. I think um, AICP activities of uh, interest to this audience. The uh, Auditing Standards Board has established a task force uh, related to ESG and attestation standards on sustainability information. Um, that task force really has kind of two primary um, functions, one to monitor the activities of the IAASB similar project. Um, and then we'll work on the, uh, a standard, uh, an ASB standard. The timeline for those, the uh, IAASB exposure draft is expected to be issued um, either late this quarter or next quarter in 2023 uh, with a final standard issued sometime in uh, probably third or fourth quarter 2024. Uh, the ASB will follow that. They are to, uh, more or less pledged to convergence with what the IAASB does, unless there are matters significant to um, uh, specific to the U.S. where there may be differentiation. So the ASB's current timeline is a uh, exposure draft that would be uh, go out in January of 2024 um, with a final standard approved probably in mid-2025. So that is all I had. Thanks, Brian. Any questions? Okay. 
If not, we'll move on to our first topic, which is segment reporting. Um, this is something for those of you who have been around for a while in FaceHack, we've discussed this many times. So I think our conversation today will be more in the mode of an update. Number of folks joining us from the project team, Mike Berriman, Mary Mazella, Lauren Motley, Chandy Smith, Justin Chudzik, and Connor Shea. We've all been working hard on this project for some time. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, so good morning, everyone. For uh, today's segment discussion, I'll take us through the comment letter feedback, as well as provide an update on uh, the next steps for the project. Um, you can, <laughs> when, we, when we met with the committee back in December, we went through each of the key elements of the proposal. I won't go back through those today, but for purposes of a quick recap, um, I'll, I'll touch on some of those. So. Under the update, an entity would be required to disclose significant segment expenses and other segment items. Uh, the proposal would also require entities with only one reportable segment to provide existing and proposed segment disclosures. Uh, it would also permit entities to disclose multiple measures of segment profit that are used by the CODM to allocate resources and assess performance. And it would expand the scope of interim disclosure requirements to be more in line with annual uh, disclosure requirements. The board issued an exposure draft in October. Um, we received approximately 40 comment letters on the exposure draft from a variety of stakeholders, including a handful of investors, preparers, practitioners, um, trade groups, academics, and, and some other stakeholder groups as well. In addition to the comment letter process, the staff did conduct supplemental uh, investor outreach. As part of that, we interviewed 17 investors. Um, they ranged from a mix of small, medium, and large organizations, and uh, also represented buy side, sell side, and credit rating analysts. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So broadly speaking, uh, stakeholders support the board's project for, for segment reporting and think that the proposed update will result in the disclosure of additional decision useful information. Um, stakeholders also support the board's decision to leverage the existing management approach from segment reporting, um, as well as the significant expense principle. Some stakeholders did provide suggestions or recommendations for ways that the board could clarify its intentions uh, for how the significance or significance threshold would be applied, and, and I'll talk through those in a bit. Um, at a more global level, stakeholders did support the board's uh, board's proposal to require single segment entities to provide all segment disclosures, as well as uh, the board's decision to permit entities to disclose multiple measures of segment profit. Um, stakeholders were also supportive of the board's decision to expand what's required on an interim basis to be more in line with annual disclosure requirements. For purposes of today's discussion, I'll talk through what was the more frequently commented items. Um, those were frequently commented because there were questions in the exposure draft and or because they were of interest to our stakeholders. Um, so with that, we can we can go to the next slide. The, the first one I want to talk through is feedback on the significant expense principle. As a quick reminder, the proposal would require entities to disclose significant segment expenses that are both regularly provided to management and included within the measure of segment profit. Um, the investors, you can flip to the next slide. So. As far as the investors interviewed by the staff, the, the majority of them did support the principle. Um, many of them commented that the significant expense principle and disclosure of segment expenses that are regularly provided to management and included within the measure of segment profit would pr produce decision useful information and enable better modeling for both segment level forecast and consolidated level forecast both from a cash flow perspective and from a segment profit perspective. Um, investors also did express support for the board's decision to utilize the management approach when developing the significant expense principle. What we heard was in addition to the quantitative information that's provided by this principle, there's also some qualitative information that's being conveyed as well um, because it's providing a deeper understanding of what information the management team is using to make management decisions and assess performance. 
from a comment letter perspective, most comment letter respondents were also supportive of the significant expense principle and think that it's clear and operable. Um, I will point out that a handful of investors that we interviewed, as well as some comment letter respondents, would prefer one of the alternatives that were considered by the board in deliberating the significant expense principle. Uh, for example, requiring disclosure of all segment expenses regularly provided to the CODM, regardless of whether or not those are included in the measure of segment profit. Um, the comment letter feedback and the investor outreach from that regard was really that those stakeholders would prefer one of the alternatives that was highlighted in the basis for conclusions. Um, there wasn't necessarily a new view that was put forth for those alternatives. The last thing I wanted to touch on on, on this uh, principle was the exposure draft contained a question for preparers asking them if they would likely disclose additional segment expenses. Um, as a result of this principle. And 80% of the preparers that responded to this question indicated that they would likely provide additional expense information. The other 20% indicated that they were unsure at this time. We can go ahead to the next slide. So the next topic I wanted to talk about is really a, a, a deeper level on the principle and it relates to the significance threshold in general. Um, so the, the board, uh, so, so sorry, let me let me back up. So entities are required to disclose significant segment expenses. Uh, the term significant is used in existing segment guidance today. The proposed update does not seek to further define that term uh, beyond what exists in today's guidance. The investors offered mixed feedback on, on the threshold. Some investors were supportive of the significance threshold noting that it would be informative and decision useful to understand what information management considers significant and generally that their analysis considers significant information. Um, a different group of investors suggested that the board should quantify or somehow define significance, for example, 10% of segment expenses or, or some quantitative threshold. And then a third group of investors interviewed commented that the board uh, should remove the threshold altogether that group generally reasoned that if the information is regularly provided to the CODM, it's probably significant. From a comment letter perspective, the, the majority of comment letter respondents noted that the significance threshold was operable, um, but provided some suggestions for ways that the board could clarify their intent uh, to make sure that, or to, to limit the potential for diversity in practice. Some of those some of the more frequently suggested clarifications included uh, clarifying whether the significance threshold is assessed at the segment level or at the consolidated level, um, clarifying whether entities are required to consider both quantitative and qualitative factors when assessing significance, and then clarifying whether the board intends for the significance threshold to be an extension of the management approach or similar to a gap reporting concept. So each of those items will be provided to the board um, as, as well as some of the other items that appeared less frequently with a supporting analysis as part of their re-deliberations. The next topic I wanted to touch on was uh, the expense reconciliation requirement. So existing segment guidance today requires an entity to reconcile segment revenue and segment profit to consolidated revenue and consolidated earnings before tax. As part of the exposure draft, uh, the board asked a question of investors, does the absence of a reconciliation requirement for segment expenses affect the decision usefulness of the expenses that are disclosed? Um, the overwhelming view of the investors that we interviewed was that the absence of a reconciliation does not reduce the decision usefulness of the expense information provided. While some investors would welcome a, a reconciliation, and, and certainly it would, it would be used if, if provide, um, while they would welcome a reconciliation, um, they noted that the absence of a reconciliation does not affect the decision usefulness of the information because generally the existing reconciliation requirements provide enough information to understand the context of the segment results with respect to the consolidated company and the manner in which the segment expense information is used doesn't necessitate a reconciliation to be decision useful. From a comment letter perspective, the, the board asked respondents or preparers if they agreed with the board's initial 
position that a, an expense reconciliation would not be operable. Um, most comment letter respondents agreed with the board's decision uh, that a, an expense reconciliation requirement would not be operable. So the last thing I wanted to talk through today uh, relates to feedback received on segment profit. Um, so some CODMs use more than one measure of segment profit for purposes of allocating resources and assessing segment performance. Under existing guidance, an entity is required to disclose the measure of segment profit that's determined to be most consistent with the measurement principles used for the consolidated amounts. Under the proposed update, that, uh, that measure is still required to be disclosed. What the proposed update does is it expressly permits entities to disclose the additional measures of segment profit that are used by the CODM for purposes of allocating resources and assessing uh, segment performance. To the extent that an entity elects to provide those additional measures, all of the existing uh, guidance related to segment profit measures would remain applicable meaning that a company would be required to reconcile those additional measures to consolidated earnings before tax. They would also be required to disclose the significant segment expenses that are included within that measure of segment profit and regularly provided to the CODM. Go to the next slide. Um, from a feedback perspective, uh, most investors supported the board's decision on this matter. Those investors commented that additional measures would provide insight into how management measures performance and manages or views operations. Um, they also noted that additional measures are commonly provided to investors in either earnings releases or shareholder presentations, and having that information in the segment footnote would be convenient and may also enhance the quality of that information by subjecting it to audit and other elevated internal control procedures. Comment letter respondents were also broadly supportive of the board's decision in this matter. Um, several noted that the board's decision here strengthens the overall management approach by deepening the information that's provided to investors to be more aligned with how management regularly reviews the business and what management uses to make uh, al resource allocation decisions and assess performance. Conversely, there were several comment letter respondents and several investors that opposed the board's decision here, and the, the views of those stakeholders was aligned with the views included in the alternative view of the proposed update. When we look forward for the, the project here, the board will need to re-deliberate the issues from the proposed update in consideration of the feedback that we've received. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is the exposure draft did not include a proposed effective date or a decision on early adoption. So the board will need to establish that as part of deliberations. Um, comment letter feedback generally indicates that a period of one year after the issuance of an ASU would be operable from an effective date perspective and no stakeholders were opposed to early adoption. Um, after the board completes its re-deliberations, the staff would draft a final ASU for vote by written ballot. Thanks, Michael. That was a great update. Um, before we go to questions that you might have, uh, do the board members have any observations or points they'd like to stress here? Okay. Questions from FACEC members? Yeah. Is, is there a minimum threshold for profitability metrics? For, could, for example, could you gross, would gross profits apply for a profitability metrics or do you need to go down further in the income statement? Under existing guidance, if the CODM is using gross profit to allocate resources and assess performance, that would be a, a measure of profit. I um, mm. think there's a view that if the CODM is also using a more cost laden measure, that that would be the, the measure that's most consistent with the measurement principles, but I do acknowledge that there's diversity on, in terms of that view. Other questions or? Yeah. I'm, I'm hung up on the Reg G this morning, but I have a question. So I was reading some of the comment letters and on, on these misleading, misleading measures. And according to the comment letters, these are exactly the measures the CODMs are using, the ones that would be you know, misleading under Reg G. So is it a problem 
if within the segment standard, companies are using and reporting a segment measure of profitability that is considered misleading by Reg G. And then it sort of raises the question, if it's now in the gap financial statements, is it a gap or a non-gap number? We know. Yeah, so from, from the perspective of topic 280 and segment reporting, I, I think we would say that if the CODM is genuinely using that information to allocate resources and assess performance, it has a function and a utility for, for that purpose. And the, the management approach is attempting to convey that information to the users of the financial statements. I do understand the view that there is some potential measures that when presented on a consolidated basis may be considered misleading. Um, but we, the, the proposal is really limited to just the measures that management is actively using for those substantive purposes. Anyone else? Oops, sorry. Oh, Dan. Um, <clears throat> and so thinking about non-GAAP measures, contribution margin is something a lot of companies think about. You would then need to reconcile that to GAAP numbers. Is that right? I mean... Correct. Any measure that's presented under the topic would need to be reconciled through to a consolidated earnings yep. before tax. Makes sense. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thanks, Michael, for that update into the whole team. I know you've worked hard on that one. Um, move on to our next topic, accounting and disclosure of software costs. Um, joining us for the project team, and they'll also be in our breakout sessions. P.K. Barrett, Jeffrey Brickman, Ashley Tiscus, Erica Friend, uh, Erica Friend, sorry, Chandy Smith, Corey Gerard, and Emerson Porter. So the purpose of this session is to seek input from council members about improvements to the accounting and disclosure for software costs. And uh, sorry, just give me the time to get in. Um, and once you get settled, Erica, we can lead off with, with you giving us a bit of an update before we move to the breakouts. Good, good morning, everyone. Can we share the, the slides too? Anna? Okay, excellent. Thanks. Okay, so today we're, we're looking forward to talking to everyone about software costs. And before we get into it on the next slide, before we dive into the guidance and the model we're looking at, we just wanted to level set what we're talking about when we say software and software costs. Um, so when we say software costs, it's costs that a company has either when they're purchasing software to use in their operations, um, it could be costs that they're incurring to internally develop something, or it could be something to modify, to either customize software or to update previous software they developed. Um, and it really covers costs that a company incurs both for software they're using to support their operations, as well as software that they may be developing to sell. And so a lot of times when you think of software, you think of the box of software you purchase, or you think of a company's major IT transformation, but there's lots of other software and it really virtually affects every company. And so on the screen here, we have some examples. So it could be software that supports a company's operations. So think of classic ERP system um, or a payroll system. Um, there's also software that facilitates services that a company provides. So you could think of an audit program that supports an audit there. Um, also in the middle, we have software that a company provides to its clients or customers to access information. So this could be a free database or a mobile banking app. And then also we have software classic that a software company sells and they could either sell it through licensing. So you either buy a box of software, which probably don't buy too much now, or you could have a digital download. Um, and this year could also be software that a company sells on the cloud so that you actually have to access through the internet. Um, and then there's also finally software that's integrated into many tangible products, either to make them work or to enhance the customer's experience. And so on the next slide, we wanted to go through also how software has evolved since the guidance has, was, was really originally developed. And so traditionally software was developed using a waterfall method. And this was a very sequential prescriptive and formal process. And so you would, you would plan, then you would develop and you would implement and, and that would be it. And you wouldn't really go back through the stages. 
Um, but there was a lot of criticism over that. And there was challenges because if you got to development and you decided you needed to ch maybe change your requirements, you didn't really go back um, and you couldn't revise them. So the agile method of development emerged to overcome these challenges. And agile is very incremental and iterative. So you really build on and you can go back. So often we talk about, you hear sprints. So a company will do two week sprints, the developers, and then they'll see you know, if what they made works and if it can be integrated into the overall product. And then they will kind of maybe revise the requirements and go, and go back around. And so it really is a very, very circular as I have the graphic there rather than sequentially. And this allows it to be managed better and to quickly incorporate changes um, and to not have failures. And so on the next slide, now we're going to dive into the current guidance. And there's two sets of current guidance. On, on the left side, you'll see what we normally refer to as internal use software guidance. And on the right side is what we refer to as external use software guidance. Um, I say that that's what we refer to because it can be a bit confusing because it, and it's very important to decide what model you're in because the models are, they have quite a bit of differences. And so you can get different outcomes depending on which model you're applying. And so I'll start with the right side. Um, the right side is really applicable. This is the external use, but it's really applicable to if you're licensing. So you're developing a license to sell to customers. That's traditionally who, who applies this model. Um, and then hosting arrangements though, if you're selling a hosting arrangement, like you're selling a cloud service, that's actually in the other model on the left side. And so, Almost all other software that I talked about before is in the model on the left side, which is in an intangibles topic, 35040. And so now we'll go into what the actual guidance is. So we'll start with 35040, which is pretty much everything except licensed software, as I said. And so this, you can see it has a one, two, and three stages. It's very, very sequential and written for a waterfall method. There's a preliminary project stage, which think of like planning activities or identifying your requirements and all costs or expenses incurred. And then you get to an application development stage. We're actually coding and testing the software. And under this stage, all eligible costs are capitalized. Uh, this stage begins when planning ends and it's probable you're gonna complete the software and it will be used to perform the function that you intended it to. And then once you pretty much finish that software, it's substantially complete, you then go into a post-implementation operation stage where most of your costs are expensed here and you begin your subsequent measurement, your amortization and impairment. So you can see it's very sequential. It doesn't really, you don't really go back. Um, so this, this guidance can be criticized that we um, companies will say we're always in the planning stage because we may go back and revise requirements. And so it can be challenging to apply this in an agile um, environment. And so the next set of guidance, which like I said, is mostly for licensed software where our customers actually getting physical possession and they can use it offline. Up until you establish what a threshold of technological feasibility, you expense everything as incurred as R&D costs. And then after, um, after you establish technological feasibility, which could either be a detailed program design, so basically saying exactly what requirements you want the software to have and how you're gonna execute it, or a working model of the software, once you have those, then you can begin capitalizing until the software is available for general release, and then you expense your costs. Um, so a little bit different than, than the other, but also still more of a, a waterfall, waterfall method. Um, so just kind of sum up the feedback we received on the current guidance is in the first red box software development has evolved um, quite substantially since the guidance was originally developed. Um, current guidance and outcomes are unintuitive, um, especially if a company is developing licensing as well as a cloud solution, you can get different outcomes as, as there's different models that are applicable. Um, there's also a lot of diversity in practice that exists because the models can be a bit confusing. And because diversity in practice exists, we've heard that there's a lack of transparency um, as well as coupled with there's minimal required disclosures in the area. Um, we've heard that from investors. And so now that leads us to our project scope and objective, which the board added this project last June so about a year ago, to address those challenges that we've talked about. And the objectives really are to modernize the accounting for software costs um, and also to enhance transparency about a company's software costs. And so this, we're looking at a full recognition, measurement, presentation, and disclosure model for really all of the software costs that, that I went over earlier. And so now I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley, who is going to go through the model that the staff has been working to develop and the board is considering in order to achieve those project objectives.
Thanks, Erica. So at the April 5th board meeting, the board decided to pursue a single model for all software costs and decided to no longer pursue a dual model. So as the name suggests, a single model would be one accounting model for all software costs. So this includes costs to acquire software, internally develop and modify software, and for all types of softwares, whether it's on-prem license, hosting arrangement, or pure internal use software. So under a single model, you would capitalize all direct software development costs from the point at which it is probable that a software project will be completed until the software project is substantially complete. So this potential guidance in the single model was leveraged from existing guidance in subtopic 35040, which is the internal use model that Erica described, um, with some changes to modernize that guidance. So most notably, we removed the stages that Erica had discussed. So in developing this model, the staff is currently researching various elements, which we're looking forward to discussing with you in the outbreak session today. Um, these are included on the slides and also in more detail in the memorandum. One thing to note though, is that the single model is very much a working model that continues to evolve as we get stakeholder feedback. And so to this point, it has not been reviewed by the board and so is subject to change. So moving to the next slide. So the first element is the probable threshold, which is the starting point for capitalization under the single model. This is leveraged from existing guidance in 35040. And even though this is used in existing guidance, we have heard from many stakeholders through outreach that additional implementation guidance would be help, helpful and would improve the operability of this threshold. So based on that feedback, the staff has been um, developing some potential indicators to improve the operability. These include evaluation of past experience, uh, management's commitment to funding, as well as whether management is compelled to complete a software project and has the ability to complete a software project. Um, some factors may be more relevant than others, depending on the type of software being developed and the entity. And some factors may indicators may need to be looked at together because they're interrelated. For example, an entity's ability and compulsion to complete often go hand in hand in evaluating whether a software project is probable of being completed. The next element is unit of account. So during outreach, we've heard from many stakeholders that it would be important to define the unit of account because this would affect how the um, probable threshold is evaluated. So for example, whether you, the unit of account is the 2x sprint that Erica described or the software project in its entirety would affect when the threshold is met and the operability of evaluating this threshold. So the current potential drafting that we have is that the unit of account is the software project, which is a group, one or more activities working together to, to achieve an overall objective. Um, in addition to this potential drafting, you would have seen, you may have seen in the memorandum that we prepared, we've also included a potential illustrative example in Appendix B. This was based on feedback from stakeholders that in addition to a definition, it would be helpful to have an illustrative example that specifically addresses sprints in an agile environment. So move to the next slide. So this just briefly touching on costs incurred after a software project is substantially complete, which is referred to as maintenance and enhancements in current guidance. So throughout the project stakeholders have also said that it would be important to have additional clarification on how to distinguish which costs should be capitalized as enhancements and which should be expensed as incurred as maintenance activities. So in response to this feedback, the staff is currently researching an alternative distinction that would actually not reference maintenance or enhancements and rather would distinguish between those activities that would be capitalized or expensed as incurred based on whether those activities add or restore significant functionality. So if you move to the next slide, how this would potential guidance would work is that any cost incurred after a software project is substantially complete would be subject to capitalization if they add or restore significant functionality, all other costs of the residual would be expensed as incurred. And then lastly, just to briefly touch on presentation and disclosure. So the staff has performed preliminary outreach with investors in during 2022 to try and understand what types of disclosures would be decision useful. Um, and during this outreach, almost all investors acknowledge that there is a lack of disclosures on software costs today, um, and that added disclosures would um, be an improvement to enhance transparency. So in response to the suggestions from this preliminary outreach, the staff has developed some potential disclosures, which are included on the next slide. Um, this is a combination of both qualitative and quantitative disclosures and are included in full in the memorandum that we shared. In addition to these disclosures, we've also prepared two illustrative examples to show what these disclosures could look like. Um, one example is for a banking company that uses software to support its operations. And the second example is a gaming company that sells software. And so we're really looking forward to your feedback on whether these examples would provide more decision useful information. And so in the last few slides, and we're not gonna go over all the questions in detail because we'll be discussing these shortly. 
But overall, we're really looking forward to hearing from members today, um, as well as basically about the overall operability of the model, including the elements that we're going to discuss suggestions for any improvements to the model, as well as hearing whether the potential disclosures would provide decision information, decision useful information. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we get started with questions from the council, board members have any observations or comments? Well, I just sort of, let me double check. I don't think anything from the board, board members. We're good? Okay, sorry. Is there any guidance on what probable means as especially as different or the same as where it's used elsewhere in the standards yeah great question so in the potential drafting we have that probable would be more likely than not no sorry not more likely that likely to occur which is <laughs> wrong, okay. wrong area um which is the same definition that's used in 450 today that's widely used throughout cap and, and also lisa that's why we've added the indicators to help help that evaluation as well so look forward to feedback um, I actually have a question. You mentioned the evolution of waterfall to agile. Did your outreach or research make any attempt to sort of look over the horizon and see what the next wave of software development is like? Mike, we do look like. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Mike. And I think while we've been trying to develop the model, we've been trying to specifically avoid any kind of agile and waterfall specific terms. So to try to make it as as timeless as we can. Obviously, we don't we can't. Not, anticipate everything that will be coming up, but making it as timeless as we can and, and maybe using examples to illustrate how it might be applied in agile environment rather than the actual guidance and, and principles itself. Um, obviously, it needs to be applied to waterfall since companies still do use waterfall, though agile is more common, um, as well as anything that will come. Bert? Just want to confirm that this doesn't change or not intended to change the cloud accounting guidance, correct? Because I, I mean, Mike, to your point, more and more things are becoming hybrid and even more and more systems, the data doesn't reside in that system, it's residing somewhere else and the system feeds on a data lake or warehouse, right? And it, it does seem to me that, that there is this context between cloud and off-prem and on-prem more and more, so. Yep, cloud, cloud computing costs and anything that you develop for cloud is in the scope of the project. Anyone else? Yep. Sure. So the, the, it, this follows the current guidance for internally uh, produced software, but my understanding is companies currently applying that guidance, many of them using the probable threshold, say that a, an, an immaterial amount is capitalized. That's pretty much all you get in the financials for many of the companies that I've seen. Is your ex expectation that would change? Um, you know, and just in the sense that it doesn't really for many companies make much difference if they just say it's an immaterial amount anyway. I mean, what would be really helpful actually is the disclosure of the total software costs, which is gonna be required, but as a, in the context of capitalizing versus expensing, if an immaterial amount's capitalized, it's, um, it's not gonna make much difference. Um, great, great question, Richard. I'm gonna answer that. I think, so it is internal use software guidance, but as I explained, it's a bit of a misnomer because it's actually covers also companies that develop SaaS solutions or cloud solutions, um, as well as companies that develop banking apps, auditing, auditing um, service programs. And so I think it, it does cover a, bri a, br a wide variety of software today. And I think there are a, there's diversity in practice, as we highlighted. So some companies do capitalize significant costs under, while others do not. Uh, a lot of that is in due to how the stages are set. So I think there is inconsistency. So we think it will affect capitalization levels, but it really depends on what model we end up with it with this very much working model, as well as the individual facts and circumstances of how the software is you know, purchased or developed. Rich? No, I, I was just going back to, to, to Bert's question and it, it'll definitely affect, I mean, if we went to an expense all model, for example, it would be hard to argue you'd have the modification of your other software to work with it would be under a different model. So I think that is part of the question and that's been part of the challenge as we explore different models. Yeah. I'm wondering, Richard, if you were going somewhere down the path of disclosing a presentation disclosure of all IT costs, like a lot of money spent on cyber now, a lot of money spent on things that 
aren't capitalized. So understanding the total, is that kind of what you were talking about? Yeah, you know, I mean, there's just a bunch of stuff that goes through R&D. And what most investors I know do is try and do a pro forma capitalization. But if you don't know what software that's likely to have a payoff in three years, what's what pure research that might have a longer term payoff, it's hard to do that. And the companies, I think if we use the probable, many companies will just continue to capitalize very little. Um, so it'll be left up to the user to do the capitalization themselves. Jonathan? Yeah, just going back to the definitions, I think, you know, the word probable, you know, there's an anchor in accounting guidance as to what that means. But the other key definition is around substantially complete. And, and so that's the piece where if you talk to developers of software, you know, they'll tell you that they're never done and, you know, they're never complete. And so there, a lot of companies sort of straddle the line with trying to um, say that they're never done in order to capitalize more costs. So I was just wondering, you know, is there going to be some thought process around what that meaning would, you know, would entail or what, what should companies anchor to? Yeah, so we're currently doing outreach in that and exploring that exactly because we've heard the same thing. Software is never done. You're always updating it. You're always releasing new updates. And so we're busy actively talking to people on that. Some ideas that have been sort of around placed into server, something like that. But we're still doing a lot of outreach on that idea. And one thing I want to also touch on with the disclosures, so it's, and I didn't go through each of those disclosures in detail, one of the potential disclosures we have in there is total software costs incurred and evaluated under the guidance. Um, and we've also included a potential disclosure now to disclose how you evaluated whether a software project was probable of being completed, to your point that many companies might interpret that slightly different, so to disclose that judgment. And it could be that potentially if something like substantially complete is also involves a lot of a judgment that potentially that's also included. We're still exploring all of that. Maybe maybe to add on about disclosures, Richard, it's also, as I said, it's meant to enhance transparency for not only those that are capitalized, but also those that are expensed. And so that's what the total software costs and the more qualitative disclosures are intended to, to get at. And, and maybe Jonathan, about your substantially complete, that's why we've tried to say software project rather than software, which is what the current guidance says, is to distinguish, right, you kind of have a unit of account that ends, and then maybe one that starts up. But as Ashley said, we're actively doing outreach with software engineers to understand how, how those, those processes are, which we found are a bit different at every company. So we're trying to mesh that, that feedback up. David. Um, I think that total software cost is really helpful to get all the information there, but the part about the disclosure with the now single model that we don't get any split of information of internal versus external, like how did that process come across? And if it's very complicated to separate it out, how was it done today? Um, and because we, we would look at things differently depending on whether it was for sale or internally, one being more like a CapEx type transaction and one is more of just OPEX to us that if you want to be in business, you need to have dedicated software costs running through your EBITDA and having that go through. And I don't think like the matching principle of the capitalization is outweighed by that just kind of theory that you have to have costs every period related to software if you want to operate a business right now versus these sort of one-time internal capitalization projects that we can think of as running through EBITDA and having that run through. Maybe to react to that a bit, David, is the board did over the past year has explored a dual model where there would have been certain software that was expenses incurred, maybe more of what you're thinking of as external software and certain software that would have been subject to capitalization. We explored many different ways to kind of cut, cut that line. And it's very, it's very blurry because, you know, you may say internal software and think of some items and somebody else may think say internal software and think of others. And so maybe you're thinking of just an ERP system like plain vanilla internal software, but then you start thinking about, you know, software you have that maybe vendors get or software your customers get for free or software your customers get as they buy purchase a ticket. And the, the, uh, the purchase of that ticket is has fees that run that app. And so I think it ends up being that a lot of software is really goes all back to revenue either directly or, or indirectly. And so the board found it really challenging to split any line in between what's internal versus external because a lot of software is external, even if it's not traditionally being sold. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think, I mean, depending on industry, we're starting to shift. Um, it's really hard 
I think everybody knows to identify what company's industry is because everything is very blended. We have conglomerates, we have all these things, but we're, we're closer. I mean, without the split for certain industries, we would have to expense the things that we think are CapEx like um, because we don't have the separation of information and we probably will be moving that direction across the board versus a capitalization model if we don't have the information. Yeah, just um, it would help me to kind of get a sense of the familiarity of the folks in the room, primarily the preparers, um, which which ones of you currently are applying 350, 40 versus which ones of you are applying 985, 20. And if you're applying both, that's great. Um, so if, if we could just do a, sh a quick show of hands among the preparers, how many how many of you are currently applying 385, uh, sorry, 350, 40? Okay, so quite a few. And and how many of you are currently applying 985-20? One. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bert, are you good? Or did you have a question or no? Uh, oh, oh, that's the last one. Okay, thank you. Well, I think, uh, oh, Steve, and then we'll uh, move on, but Stephen. Yeah, I, I guess maybe, you know, and again, maybe I know the board's gonna go forward maybe more, more on this, but I, I think some dilemma is just, how we present the software today. I mean, it's in two different places on the financial statements and it creates confusion, right? Because when I'm developing internal software for, for a company, it's going in PP&A and it's getting buried and allocated throughout my P&L. Matter of fact, you probably don't see it if you're an investor. But if you're selling software, which I'm, that's not my business, like a Microsoft, it is something that gets kind of very buried in cogs because there is a margin associated with that software. Or, or again, I don't want to speak for the, any other company, but but I think that's kind of where I think most companies would report it. anything that has cost related. That people want to know margin related to 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 the selling of it. So I, I think that's going to be important. I think if we go to a single model, what does that really mean for presentation? And are we going to put everything in one spot? I know some folks have said, well, is software really an intangible? Why is it a fixed asset? But I think if you're building an ERP system, I think it is a fixed asset. And I think it makes sense to put it there. So we're going to have this dilemma constantly. How are we going to find it? And I, I keep hearing I this question. Like, I think, David, you said the same thing. Like, how do you find this amortization? It's, it's all over the place on the P&L. And, and guess what? It's in two different places on the balance sheet which is very different as well. So, so I, I'm not sure how it's gonna get melded together with a single model yet presented in two different places and different places on the p &L. Well, David, presumably, I don't know, or hopefully DICE would help with that um, in the location of a lot of this stuff, maybe. I, I, I don't know how to, maybe I could reverse engineer something like that with seeing where amortization related to this, if there was enough detail to get back amortization related cogs to software for sale, but that that would be interesting. I mean, that would be helpful, but it is a problem right now of understanding where everything is related to this. So, so I, I think we're getting a sense that we're gonna have some robust discussion in the breakouts. So why don't we, uh, which is great, which is absolutely you know, what we want. So let's, let's move to that now. Uh, breakout discussions will start at 10.50, go to noon. Um, for those on the uh, the live stream here, those are private sessions, so you can rejoin us uh, when we reconvene at 1 p.m. For those here, as you move to the breakout room, there are beverages and snacks available in the boardroom break breakout area. Um, you have the discussion quest questions, copy the assigned groups is around the table. Um, for each of the group, as always, there'll be two co-leaders, co and then I'm going to turn it over to you to describe where these rooms are so I don't lose any council members, which wouldn't be a good way to start my next term. Sure, happy to. In some of the rooms you'll be familiar with, uh, breakout room A is in Miami. So we're going to do a little traveling here. It's out the, out the door toward the reception area, that, that the conference room with the glass. Um, breakout room B is in Columbus, which is a little bit more difficult to find. It's um, actually downstairs. The easiest way will be to go out this door here. So after break, there'll be people to guide you if you, if you come up to the stair area down here and we'll, and we'll take you downstairs as it requires key card access. Um, breakout group C is in the small boardroom, which is directly behind us this way. So easy to find. And we'll meet you there uh, after coffee break. Thank you. We'll, we'll leave breadcrumbs, we promise. Just, just a second. For the virtual participants, you can stay connected to the meeting. You'll automatically be moved 
And also keep your meeting link open through lunch. Just turn your video off. Um, then we'll break for lunch for an hour and we'll be back at one o'clock. So thanks everyone. I could get everyone's attention. Welcome back folks, excuse me. All right, folks, we're getting started here. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Hopefully uh, the energy we have in the room is reflective of all the good ideas that we had when we uh, had our break breakout discussions. Welcome back to our online folks as well. Uh, so we'll go through and get that feedback. I think the way I'll group it is start with the first question, then maybe group questions two, three, and four, which are around recognition and measurement, and then end up with presentation and disclosure. I suspect if your conversations are like ours, um, it might be a bit of a challenge to stay within those parameters. I'm not going to, you know, be too prescriptive in that regard. Um, obviously, the goal here is to have a, a good, robust conversation. We have plenty of time, so I think uh, feel free to uh, elaborate as you go through. So, um, Lisa and Jan, I'll start with you. Um, I think we can start with the with the first question in terms of the the, the variety of and of the the different softwares that are currently um, used in uh, in the practice. I th I think no, it's it's a pretty good definition currently in the in the proposed uh, model. So uh, that covers a wide range of different softwares that that people are using out there. So it, uh, I think that we start with that. Nothing seems to be out of this uh, current range that's in the definition. I think one of the comments that we do want to bring forward is, uh, I mean, now we really head into a digital age. Everything is going digital and and and, and virtual. So so the line between like software versus applications and other technologies out there are getting blurred each and every day. So just keep that in perspective. So that was really it. Great. Tom, Kathy, you have any thoughts on that first topic? Yeah, I think we had some good discussions just around software overall. And, and I think it was generally acknowledged that, you know, software is embedded in all of companies' processes. So it was somewhat difficult to think about it under one accounting model. So the example was, you know, software could be used to improving margins, for example, improving fulfillment or logistics in actually delivering a product versus it could be something that's uh, generating revenue or has to be used by a customer to generate revenue or lastly used for a fixed asset or something like an ERP system. So as we had debates around all of these different models, people began to think about them differently around, you know, when is it appropriate to capitalize and what information would you really want? Um, I think it was clear that um, the investors of the group really want to understand the dollars spent and the reason for the dollars spent um, by project um, to really ha have a better sense for you know, the investments that are being made by a company. Um, there were also some observations that um, software changes in, in certain respects never end and projects may never end. Um, the example was like a customer facing software program. There might be tweaks every single day relative to that program. So thinking about it under this model, when we talk about sort of the next steps can be very challenging and difficult. And um, you know, lastly, um, some of the investors said that um, more capitalization might lead to additional impairments, and that might lead to some more concerns around comparability um, between um, preparers and, and, and companies, and that might actually create, um, you know, m more difficulties in doing assessments and comparability than we have under today's models. Great. Thanks. Bert, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we had a similar discussions, um, you know, a lot of focus on the, you know, the, the investor representation in the room really talked about differentiating between you know, revenue generating and non. Um, I do think that then we got into a, there was a lot of stuff in the middle bucket that touches customers, but may not be directly revenue generating. And, you know, you have a banking app, right? And it provides a customer experience, but you're not selling it separately, right? And yeah, did you almost get into three different buckets? It, it really seemed to be a confusing that we really got into yeah, I think we kind of settled back into that it if you're going to do something that needs to be a more consistent than you know rules, but maybe the disclosures really help get into helping 
differentiate how some of those pro, uh, pro things come out, right? Versus, you know, I think while we we debated the three kind of three buckets of directly to revenue generating, directly internal things in the middle that do both, it really started to get into a bit of I think as we talked through it more, that almost opened up more Pandora's box. So, okay. As I said, I'm going to set a group two, three, and four, and there's obviously a lot of meat here. You know, two dealing with the probable threshold, three on the unit of account, and then four on costs incurred. So um, why don't we start with Tom and Kathy on this one? Uh, we really looked at the probable question and the unit of account question together. Um, and the issues that came up there were the main issue we were hearing both from preparers and users um, was that the probable threshold um, just simply was different, you know, in a, in a more significant way than maybe those of us who haven't applied the external model before um, had realized. So in practice, the technological feasibility was being applied at a very high threshold. Um, so this uh, was understood to bring a lot more costs onto the balance sheet. Um, and then with that, you know, as we've mentioned, then you have more impairment assessment and, and things like that. So there was just an overall question about, you know, is that threshold too low? Um, there was also uh, some discussion about, you know, if you are a software company and your threshold is probability, um, your software developers will always say something is probable because that's just sort of the nature of the beast and then the way they would operate. So, um, so in that way, again, talking about more costs coming onto the balance sheet and for a lot of our uh, users in the room, that wasn't necessarily helpful to them. Um, and then in terms of the unit of account, um, the interplay between the unit of account and probability, um, there's a lot of judgment in there. You could get to different answers on probability depending on what your unit of account is. Um, the project uh, notion of defining what a software project is um, felt like a challenge to operate internally um, and also one where there could be both a lot of judgment and then different answers based on what that judgment is, all of which could contribute to um, non you know, comparability and also challenge of implementation and maintenance. Um, we also talked about whether or not the unit of account was intended in the proposal to be a dynamic concept, but how in reality the, the projects would almost would have to be dynamic in the sense that they are always changing and being revisited in terms of the scope of the projects and, and what we're looking to accomplish. And it was unclear how that dynamic aspect was intended to be applied. Um, we, ha we had a lot of discussion on both of these. So um, I might wanna also just open it up to anyone else in our group who wants to add anything there. I don't know, Liz, I know you had some thoughts about applying it. Um, you mentioned a lot of them. I think just this point about how the projects actually happen in practice uh, would be important to explore before finalizing a standard because often you don't, it's not just the difference of whether you apply waterfall or agile. It's you might start with a very small sprint and then depending on how that goes, you might invest more and expand the project. And, and that could result in a, a very different answer. You can view it as probable and just decide to invest more or less depending on how it proceeds. Okay. Um, Bert and Stephen. Okay, okay. Sure, I'll go to So, you know, you, very similar, you know, Catherine, same discussion also. Um, the question that we kind of debated a little bit then discussed was the notion of probability it's so judgmental, particularly between we look at internal versus external. You know, does it really work? Does it really make sense? And and again, to your point, what we heard is like for internal Phelps software, it seemed like for the most part it will work. And anytime you enter a big ERP system, it, we, it will. It, it's always probable that it will actually be successful. And I think Bert, you said, well, it's a business need. And like the, the company needs the ERP system to be implemented. They're not going to stop moving. However, there's a different audience for selling software which I think is very different. And then how do you come up with the judgment to actually say when does capitalization begin? And then we, we even discussed those indicators. I mean, we appreciate the indicators and they make sense, but they are, is that, you know, do we need to get more prescriptive or do we leave it open? You know, that was another question that was kind of asked 
you know, how detailed do we need to be on these indicators? And does that make any sense? And, and does that going to help or hurt, you know, investors or preparers? Um, the other thing we heard is, you know, selling software, I heard, there's, there's a notion of version control. If you're creating a version one that's successful, then version two, three, and four, is it automatically probable? You know, if you're selling software, which was really interesting, versus a software that is being sold for the first time, right? That's not been out there. So, how do you define that probability um, versus version one, two, and three, and four? Um, the other thing is um, uniqueness of the software for a customer that's versus broad. You know, that's another thing you have to think about because if you if you're doing software for a customer that's unique and it's not going to work, it's going to definitely be impaired. And that's the impairment question that comes up as well. Um, so, so the question is, how does that all play in as a, as a potential indicator, as it's based on, is it based on customer expectations? Um, when is this economic benefit, which is very different than something that's being developed internally um, as an ERP system, which managers are going to use for internal purposes versus being sold? Yeah, I think a couple of things. I mean, I think we we really debated a lot about is probable the right term, right? Yeah. I mean, I think to yeah. Stephen's point on the internal use, you're normally building something to solve a business issue that doesn't go away. And so you're going to probably keep doubling down till you solve it. So you may be over budget or inefficient in your build, but you probably are still going to actually succeed at some point, right? Or have to do something. Um but I think we also, even in the external world, we got into this debate around, is this more akin now to fixed assets? I mean, you know, the technology is advanced to where most things are very, you know, not, I don't want to use the word technologically feasible because that's, you know, defined, right? But in some ways, I mean, you know, a lot of things have already been invented in some way or shape. And so people are taking different twists on stuff. But I mean, there are clearly certain moonshots, right? Self-driving cars or things like that. But most things, if you wanted to build an instant messaging app, right, people have done it. And you may be adding features to it that others haven't, right? You may be putting your own spin on it, but it's not like it's never, a lot of these things have never been done. And so I think we, we debated a lot around is probable the right word. I even threw out, should you have more like likely, right? Or something like that. Or what I think, what was the word I used, Rich? Probable, po yeah, po possible probable or something like that, right? Probably probable, right? Probably probable, right? You know, um, exactly. Um, yeah, we also talked about some of the indicators of whether how helpful they are. Um, you know, should you also be looking externally to the market, not just internally? The indicators seem to be internally fo focused. Um, yeah, but I, I do think if you think about this fixed asset example, right, of, hey, is this a more routine-ish, Activity. I mean, you, know, you if you thought about inventory, even right. I mean, I could argue a manufacturing company. You know, the labor and overhead being applied is not really. You know, that product's not ready to sell until it's actually finished, right? So, would you not only would you only capitalize the last minute of the manufacturing process, right? And that doesn't seem right to any of us, right? But that's kind of what we're doing in software, right? And and so that was a an issue. Um, in our group, at least question three, unit of account wasn't discussed much. And then on four, since you combined all of them, Mike, um, we got into this a lot too. I mean, maintenance seems like a really weird term, right? Um, you know, and I think especially, I mean, you think about updates you get all the time and your common software products. You, If you actually look at what happens, there's a big mix of bug fixes and enhancements and, you know, and so I think we were also going to even things around, is it restoring value? Well, that almost seems like it was impaired before the mate, the thing came out, you know, but I, again, if you go down this fixed asset analogy, I, I do think we kind of said, Hey, you know, there's debate, there's judgment, but you know, if you have a building and you repave your parking lot or you replace your HVAC systems, we handle that today using some of the principles, right? And should you be applying some of that same sort of stuff here, right? Is it how significant it is to the overall cost of the project? How how detailed it is? What does it do? Things like that versus trying to get into defining some level of what is maintenance and what is, you know, enhancements and whatnot. Uh, so I think that was another really interesting discussion. And it really gets back into, even if I went back to one is, 
I'm not sure that we're completely sure which problem we're trying to solve here, right? Because even the investors, I think, had some, you know, maybe this is a question five thing, but I think there was some, yeah, they liked it, but I think they could get some more information, but it was kind of like, okay, what is it? And you know, I don't know if you want to talk about, yeah, you know, I think you, you mentioned that you said that there's, you know, you, know, you you look at the disclosures, they're helpful, but you're really more focused on cash flows and things like that, right? So I think even with this single model, we are still going to require or look at it from a, whether it's a revenue generating software or an internally developed software for internal use only. And that's why we came up with, I think for the disclosures, we might still need those two or three buckets. And the third bucket, which I'm talking about in the middle is something which came up was, it's not exactly revenue generating and it's not exactly only for internal use, but there's a gray area in between, which may be maintaining client relationships or customer. And you know, it's okay from a user's perspective, if you have that third bucket, as long as it's clearly disclosed, because you know, that will give users, you know, information that they can use the way they want. But I think without that, just having all costs capitalized, I think that's going to be a challenge, right? Especially even, I think the other thing we discussed was around software companies. If you have all these costs capitalized for software companies and you just have amortization or depreciation in there after capitalization, you don't have an operating cost, right? So I think compare that to a manufacturing company, you have capitalized costs like pp e but then you also have inventory accounting, which turns into cost of sales. You wouldn't see that in this single model with software companies, right? So those are the kind of things which we need to kind of think through in the single model. But I think the critical part will be the disclosures if you go down this path. So, I mean, I, I, I view that as, you know, even though I think the investors were a little bit around. So I, I think I also wonder are we really clear which problem we're actually trying to solve here? Is it we have two models and they don't always work and we're trying to reduce complexity? Or is it, you know, the accounting nerd in me is always ready to come up with a new model, but is that really what we need? And is it, you know, is this because it is more like fixed assets and we should start uh, making it conform a little bit more? Is it because investors aren't getting what they are? I do think some of these things really have to drive back to what problem are we trying to solve here as well, so. Christine. Yeah, I just had a question for Bert. When you were talking about different words for different types of thresholds, so do you view probable and likely to be different from one another? I I do. Um, I think historically in accounting, one you know, more likely than not, I guess, is is you know typically fifty one percent probable. I think is a higher threshold, right? You know, seventy plus percent. You know, the math people in us. But part of it was is because probable was in the old standard, mm -hmm. and it's already been interpreted one way. I think part of it too was is are people going to link back to that historical practice because you use the same word? Okay, as well. Yeah, because so. the way the way the new guidance would define probable is likely. So if you actually look at the definition of probable, it says likely to occur. So. They're being used interchangeably within the guidance, but that's why I was curious because I think, I think there's a tendency to think of probable as being a higher threshold than likely. And I, I worry that if we use the word probable and then point to a definition that is likely, that that's going to result in some slippage. That if, if what we really mean is likely, we should just use the word likely. Mm -hmm. Okay. We say, yeah. Sure. So uh, go back to the probable question. Um, our group had many of the similar thoughts has been mentioned, but uh, one thing that struck me as different in our group was that uh, different individuals expressed comfort um, with a extreme comfort with capitalizing and others expressed a lot of comfort with expensing. And so it seems like there's strong priors um, based on whatever experiences people have. And um, and I'll come back to that in a second. So everyone liked the indicator approach to help operationalize the word probable. Um, um, the, the deal though, is that we think the indicators might be viewed or interpreted differently depending on one's prior about capitalization or expense. And so the bottom line then is that we really haven't gotten away from a dual model perhaps because people 
um, you know, sort of have this notion that, you know, if it's internal, I'm going to, if it's internal software, I'm going to in, in interpret those indicators one way. If it's external software, I'm going to interpret those uh, indicators another way. Um, and so perhaps we haven't gotten rid of the dual model um, in that regard as well. Um, and a, another comment that was made um, was that the word probable doesn't mean um, that it necessarily will lead to an economic benefit, which is the definition of an asset. It's probable that it will be completed. And so it may be a very high risk project that money is being thrown after, um, you know, and it may not end up being actually an asset according to the current definition. Okay. Um, so then let's move to presentation and disclosure and I'll start with Bert and Stephen this time. You know, what we heard, I think, from, from at least from folks, you know, this notion of total cost. I, I think, Rich, I like your, I think of the donut, you know, the biggest circle and the little circle. And, and um, this, this notion of, you know, what, what, are, what are total costs that we're trying to tr track? What's in that bucket? And, you know, what are investors really asking for in that total cost? Is it all software costs or is it just software costs that are, that are just external, you know, for selling? Or, or, or if you're if you're prepared that's not in the business of selling, are they asking the question on software costs? Because software costs are just no different as PP&A, which is already disclosed in alpha tables today of what major projects that are initiatives for internally developed. So I think that, so the disclosures, you know, there was a and again I, I think what they we did here was a roll forward table would be helpful. And mm -hmm. that would be something we heard that was really good. Um, I think Lara said she she thought a matrix might be really great, where you have internal, external, and then and in a third bucket of everything, because if people really, really want to know, they usually lay it all out in that disclosure and where all these costs are coming from, but, but for the different types, um, internal, external, and other, um, so that they know what the total costs are. But again, at the end of the day, it is about cash flow, right? And I think they want to know where the cash is coming from. And if, if you put on the balance sheet or you're expensing it, it's really cash flow in the period that they want to understand what, what, what is, what, where it's coming from. So you're going to jump in there too. Well, yeah. I think first to define Rich's donut, he never used the word donut, by the way. Um, <laughs> but but you, I like you, it. You like the I donut, like it. right? It, it was like my donuts. baking analogy. Yeah, the baker over here went straight to donut when he saw two circles. But yeah, but I think there is in, in the in the proposal, there's a concept of the bigger circle, which is you have to talk, you have to disclose the total amount of software cost incurred, right? And then there's, if you will, the smaller circle of what you would actually capitalize, right? Uh, yeah, and I think one of the concerns was, is at least one I have as an auditor, which gets into is, but if both of them are a little nebulous, right? There's a lot of judgment involved is, how do you really get into comparability and are you going to get really different definitions and should at least one of them be anchored, right? Maybe both of them don't have to be anchored, but at least one of them does. Um, but I also, the other thing that took a lot of time and, you know, John, well, I don't know if you want to talk about your experience a little bit around, you know, a banking and yeah, not necessarily, but I mean, you get a lot of questions around like, you know, how the spend is being, you know, tracked and it's not necessarily comparable between your, you and your competitors, right? And you, know, you want to talk about how people have asked questions of you and your your company, right? So, yes, we get. I mean, most of the banks get questions regularly from analysts around tech spend, uh, and how you define that is not uh, been consistent, right? And so, uh, in certain instances, banks would provide the total amortized cost in that year. So, what's capitalized and amortized through the year? presenting software costs uh, that went through the PL that year. In other instances, you're thinking about uh, the total cost, the, the big circle, right? Uh, you include in not just what's amortized that year, but uh, other costs that are associated with tech development that are not capitalized that you've incurred during the year. Uh, and there's also the notion of cash, right? Do you talk about the cash spend in the year? And so that comparability becomes challenging if you're an investor, an analyst. Uh, but when I think about the way that information is used, uh, in the two ways, one is you're running it through a model. Well, if it's, if it's you know, if you want to run through a P&L, you want to see the total expense that went through the year. If, it's, if you're using cash, then you want to use the, the, the cash expenditure in the year. 
but an analyst you're really interested in, in addition to what you're spending, what you're doing with that spend, so the benefits, the uh, returns on that spend, uh, what you get in terms of customer flows, traffic, acquisitions, et cetera. There's a variety of metrics that go with uh, software development. So uh, not proposing we introduce that part of it, you know, meaning the benefit side, but I think a qualitative description of the results of your uh, software spend, I think is important. So again, it's back to this, is it total cost? Is it, and how do you define total cost? And then is it just the, the cost that you've amortized in the year? Anybody else from our group? Want to, anything we missed? Yan and Lisa? Yeah, um, maybe we can swing back a little bit because uh, our group also spent a, a lot of time talked about the unit of account and, and the, the, the definition of substantially complete. Um, I, I think in terms of the unit account, uh, what we understand is the current Definition is a little too broad as uh, compared to the the prior version. I think it was a prior version just to to mention just the sprint itself, but it'd be too too of a narrow too narrow of a definition. So, but with the with the current definition, um, I think one of the the member brought up the sort of the time horizon related to the project. Um, I think it was Debbie that that talks about much a, a longer term perspective instead of a shorter term perspective. Debbie Warren. Yeah, I think, you know, we just talked a little bit about, about, you know, project could mean, you know, depend, could mean multi years, multi versions, multi releases. And, and if it was more on milestone based, release based, you put it into service and you start amortizing it. And if it's a longer project, you may have issues that there should be, you know, some impairments, some abandonments, things like that, that you wouldn't have that risk as much if you're doing it more on, you know, the subcomponents of projects. So that's one thing we talked about. So potentially maybe adding a, a list of factors to uh, differentiate the, the, the unit account, um, maybe added a little more, more definition to that. Uh, we also talk about uh, cost incurred subsequent, um, subsequently in terms of the substantially complete, the words, the the restoration, enhancement, and functionality could mean uh, very different things to very different companies. I know Jonathan, you had a a point about um, functionality versus enhancement. Yeah, I think I think the lines get very blurry when you talk about enhancements and functionality. Sometimes you know through the agile environment, uh, you know, the developers are focusing on speed, for example. So they're delivering essentially the same functionality, but maybe faster. So how do you interpret that in the context of, you know, do you capitalize or not? So I think there's different things that need to be clearly defined. And, and sometimes you may actually, you know, through the various iterations, you may remove some functionality because you're satisfying, you know, a potential user's needs. So in that context, you're, you know, essentially adding by subtraction. How do you address, you know, that type of uh, uh, transition? Great. Hey, anything else you want to jump in? Um, the word was, um, I think David Gonzalez had some comments on the word restore and the difficulty with that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the restore doesn't really, uh, kind of align with what I think is a capitalizable cost. And presumably that's already been capitalized. And I think in practice, that part that was already capitalized probably won't be expense. So then you would get to capitalize something twice because you didn't do it correctly the first time. And I think that restore is not really in line with how we describe or think about assets. It, it enhances or extends the life or does anything like that. Just putting it back together doesn't seem like a, a real capitalizable cost that we would want in there, um, and so we wouldn't have that go there. So now to the question, the presentation question. Um, so uh, if you recall my comment about the probable word that there, we may not have actually gotten rid of the internal external um, distinction 
um, because the word probable and the indicators will be interpreted in light of, um, you know, whatever you want to interpret it as. Um, the, the same comment was made here for presentation and disclosure. Um, and that is, um, if we have a single model, then how are we going to decide how to present, for example, on the income statement or on the statement of cash flows? Because if it is, you know, external for sale, then you presumably want it in cost of goods sold. Um, and if it was internal use, you wouldn't. And so is that dual model still kind of lurking behind the scenes, even though we have a single model accounting standard. And so those questions would need to be answered. And I know, David, again, you've had issues with your analysis on um, placement and finding the numbers. Yeah, I think if if there is a single model, the absolute minimum is we need disclosure of the amount that's being amortized through cost of goods sold. Like that's that's got to be the minimum, even before DICE or without relying on some other accounting standard, because we would need to be able to create an EBITDA for software companies that makes sense and doesn't remove the substantial portion of their operating costs and disguise them as investing. Okay. Let me, um, Stephen, did you have something? Just an, another comment, I was just going through my notes that came up was even questions about, I guess, hosting arrangements and would, would, would there be a thought to consider putting that in a different bucket of internal software? Because right now we, we haven't leased a bucket right now in 985, but there was a question someone raised saying, is this really an intangible, these hosting arrangements that have been created for, for preparers? Is that really an intangible versus where we have it today? So just a, a thought. Okay. I'd like to um, maybe go back around oh, broadly and see if uh, the users have any additional comments. I know some of them came out in this discussion, but I think uh, getting to the point of what are we trying to fix and what would be most helpful, I'd, I'd really love to throw it open to all of the users and you know get your input on that front. David. I mean, from my perspective, like it seemed like there was a two pronged problem here. There was the input side that preparers were struggling with two models and there was the output side that users were struggling with disaggregating the two models. And that disaggregation on the output side is gone. So we, we're, we're back with the same problem we have right now is trying to understand what costs are more PPE like and what are more revenue generating, but we still have the problem and we'll still have to take an all or nothing approach based on probably the type of industry that this company is in. And then we'll get to the gray area companies that are like even automotive where you're getting closer and closer to selling a computer versus an automobile. Where do you land in that? Um, it, it's, it's still the same problem for the investor side. <laughs> Thank you. Other comments from users? Oh, Todd, thank you. Yeah, I guess just from my perspective, I think in terms of the investor problem we're trying to solve, I, I take to David's point, but I think frankly, the amount of software that's being capitalized is relatively immaterial overall. Um, my fear is, I think, listening to the conversation, that defining probable, likely, probably probable is, that <laughs> yeah. is we're going to end up with a whole lot more capitalization. Um, and I don't know if that's something necessarily investors are asking for. I do struggle with that. So I take Richard's class, you know, you do kind of sit there from a theoretical standpoint and say, well, if I'm investing in something and it has a useful life more than three years, then maybe it should be on the balance sheet. I just think from my perspective in practice, nine out of 10 investors and probably nine out of 10 companies are going to back that up, right? Um, of their non-GAAP, and we talked about segments. I can, I'll put money down that this will be a significant expense. It'll probably be backed out <laughs> of segment level disclosures, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think I think it kind of is the nature of the problem is the unit of account. Um, it's going to be very different, and so comparability, I worry, will struggle. And so, I think I think that's the natural reaction that humans and investors have is you try to put things back on a, an even playing field. Um, and then one, one last point on presentation. I also, where I think this is most material. A lot of these software costs are paid through stock-based compensation. So I think it would also be important to understand um, cash spend versus equity spend. Brian. 
Yeah, thanks. So I, I mentioned this a bit in our breakout room, so and, and I know some of this has been touched on, but as an investor in primarily software, you know, companies that are selling software, software companies in, in, in many vertical and horizontal SaaS models, um, we actually back out most capitalization, if not all of it. Then we look at the, just the cash impact uh, because it's just become so confusing overall to find out where it is. And so uh, plus one to Todd's comment about trying to avoid more capitalization um, that might come out of this, this project. But in any event, no matter where it ends up, the most important part for us is getting better comparability and better understanding of the geography on the PL as to where this is being impacted. So I think that's that cost of goods sold, even our own companies are inconsistent. And even though we try to provide explicit guidance about what is in cost of sales and what is in R and D. Uh, and so that's, that's to me as important as anything um, to just get a better sense on however your invest an investor or user wants to interpret it, um, that they can get comparability. Uh, it, it, and, and certainly some capitalization is clearly warranted based on internal versus externally, uh, externally sold software. But um, that would be the, the still, I would add that to the, um, list of the the problems we're trying to solve here, but I think that the PL geography is almost is almost paramount in my mind. Other comments from users? I just had a uh, follow up question. This uh, earlier discussion for the users about this idea of um, what spend disclosure you're looking for, because the John Bull's comment is it is it just software spend that you're looking for? Or are you looking for tech spend generally, and you differentiate hardware versus software when you're trying to think about this, this issue? It's probably all the above. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were talking like about you, for instance, you know, um, I mentioned the stock-based, you know, that's a dynamic right now. These companies are going to, are they going to have to pay more in cash or more in stock or how's that pendulum swing? So it, it does important, but I think made to John Bull's point, it's kind of a revert, re return on invested capital is ultimately, but it, and it also gets to the point of the nature of the expense, right? Are you paying up more for, I mean, here's a debate right now. Are you paying up more for cloud hosting? Or are you going to, are you going to shift that spin towards AI? So it's a hardware versus software and how's that evolving, right? Um, so I think it is all of the above, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, not saying we need to draw those lines, but I think the the impetus is trying to understand the nature of the expense and that rate of change. Yeah, no, I, I would just reiterate that. I'm one of the analysts who's asking Citigroup those exact mm -hmm. questions. Um, and and yes, there's it is frustrating as an, as an analyst. The, the lack of comparability in terms of how much disclosure banks give more broadly on tech spend and what's included there. But in, in, at a very high level, what we're looking for is more broad. It's how much is being spent on tech and what are the economic benefits of that? What is it being spent on? How much of it is run the company? How much of it's grow the company? And what's the real economic value of it? What is it driving? Is it driving revenue growth? Is it driving efficiency? Is it driving uh, better compliance outcomes, better risk outcomes. That at the end of the day is what we want to know. We want to know what's being spent and how much and, and what kind and having a better sense of what the economic benefit of that could be. I, I just wanted to pick up maybe on the on Todd's point about the materiality of software. So I, I'm I'm a little bit unclear as to you know why we're more comfortable with capitalizing hard assets, but not, you know, soft assets. And I think this maybe kind of goes to the, you know, theory of we're seeing more and more companies, you know, digitize themselves and get into more of a kind of a soft, you know, space. And, you know, we're kind of sitting with a lot of, you know, assets that are, you know, clearly kind of intangible. You can't really touch or, 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 or feel. And, and so now you have a situation where, you know, there's an opportunity to capitalize and, and you know, with the right, um, you know, caveats and indicators, you can think about, you know, whether or not there's going to be an impairment, you know, cost down the, down the line, but you should, you know, you should have those parameters in place as companies are kind of thinking through, you know, their process. I, I just feel like we're entering into a different type of economy where, you know, perhaps materiality should not be an issue. Uh, it shouldn't be a factor. We may see more capitalization. Maybe that's the right thing to do. David? 
touchdown. Hold on. Yeah, touchdown, I, Christine. Yeah, because I, I guess I have a slightly different perspective, Jonathan. I don't think it's a soft asset versus a hard asset issue. I think that if we were to look at hard assets and say when a company is developing a hard asset, we're going to treat that as if they're developing property plant equipment. I would have the same problem with that as I have with saying if I'm developing for sale. Okay, so you know, we have for a reason an R&D model and a PP&E model. And I guess I struggle with just because it's software, now I'm supposed to ignore those differential economics and treat it as if it's all PP&E. That, that's where I struggle. So it's not, it's not to me as, you know, that, that I'm treating hard assets one way and soft assets another. It's, it's in both cases, I should be thinking about the economics of the activity and um, I can understand why users struggle when it's revenue producing and it's developing a product, why that would be capitalized. Because you know, if GM is developing a new car, they're not capitalizing those costs, right? It's gonna be R&D. So, um, so I, I guess I look at it a little bit differently. David? I mean, I thought Saul's, um characterization was very good that 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 input that disaggregation of the input based on the expected output and that's what we're looking for and now you've blended the input into one bucket and now we need to look at the output is this cost reduction is this revenue is it generating and i think <clears throat> jonathan's point is is um valid but i i also take a different perspective of it that maybe we're just mi moving into an era where putting things on the balance sheet doesn't make sense anymore and the disaggregation of the cost is something that we can compare and say, here is the, I mean, ideally we just wanna get into what is the investment in the future of this company? And I can, if I have that disaggregated, I can look at the revenue it generates in the future and I have something to account for it and not wait for impairments or assume that the timing of this capitalization is gonna match the revenue that comes through. Maybe the, the move is just away from assets on the balance sheet and more into what are they putting into the company and a separation and tracking it that way. And that's the way I, I, I would prefer it actually to be. Bert. Yeah, I mean, I've a lot of, lot of subjects here, but I, I do think too that, um, well, just one aside, one thing on just the scope, you know, I think that we talk about internal and external, but I think somebody just mentioned that there's a lot more projects that start as internal company to develop something for their own need and all of a sudden realize, Hey, there may be a market. Other people may want this. Right. And that's happening more and more. So I think the lines are getting blurred to Jonathan's point, but I, I really want to go back to Saul's point. And, you know, to me, what you said makes sense. I'm not sure you would get that out of the standard and, you know, maybe that's just a takeaway for the staff, but I think it is, um, maybe worthy a little bit more discussion too of what it, are there things that you could do that would change it, right? So. And I'll add as an auditor, I'm scared about actually making statements about, wow, this tech spends for future calls, you know, how, how I'd audit that, that's a whole different issue, but yeah, we can probably work through that as well, but. Yeah. Any other comments that came up in your groups that someone wants to, uh... Re reiterate or emphasize. Questions or observations from board board members? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I suspect this isn't the last time we'll be discussing this, uh, but hopefully we gave you and your team some, uh, some input that would be helpful and uh, appreciate your time and effort with that. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move on to uh, update on select projects and Hillary and Nellie will lead us in that discussion. Yep. And we appreciate that Rich gave an update a little bit earlier today on some of the final standards and exposure drafts that we've issued over the course of the last quarter. We'll give you a bit more detail on that. And then also just want to highlight things that are beginning be coming down the pipeline in the next quarter or so. Um, just so you can kind of understand how we're moving through our agenda. We don't want to catch anybody off guard. That is a really loud door. <laughs> anyway, uh, but certainly we want to just make sure, give you the heads up with regards to where we are on our projects. And certainly we've seen that through FACEAC, 
having some of these discussions and highlighting that. And if you have any questions, letting us know later you know, so that we can have you know separate conversations about it has been really helpful from the staff's perspective. So appreciate your time as we kind of go through our little bit of our CPE session here this afternoon. Um, so maybe if we can move to the next slide. Uh, first, let's just focus with regards to some of those recently proposed or final changes to GAP. And if we can move to the next slide there. Just to give you a little bit more detail, Rich kind of highlighted the exposure drafts that we issued this last quarter, um, but one related to income tax disclosures. And this obviously has been feedback that we've received from an investor perspective that this is an area that's a bit of a, a blind spot for investors, that they're really looking for additional transparency to better understand a company's worldwide operations, understand where there are legislative risks and opportunities, and how that might impact a company's tax rate and future cash flows. Um, certainly, we have existing guidance today in our rate reconciliation, which takes us from right our effective or takes us from our statutory rate to our effective tax rate. Uh, and we also have the total income taxes paid disclosure, either in the statement of cash flows or in the footnotes. But what investors have told us is that they're really looking for that additional granular level of detail that's not necessarily already provided in the existing disclosures. So what we did is we already had our income tax project on our agenda and had a few different iterations over the years. But based on the feedback that we received through the agenda consultation process, we were able to reframe that and really focus on providing that additional transparency through the rate reconciliation as well as the income tax income taxes paid disclosure. Um, so just quickly with regards to the rate reconciliation, the board did require that on an annual basis that public entities would have to disclose specific categories of in the rate reconciliation, as well as provide further disaggregation of reconciling items within those categories if a specific quantitative threshold is met. And then with regards to income taxes paid, on um, both an annual and an interim basis, entities would be required to disaggregate income taxes paid uh, by federal, state, and foreign. And then from an annual basis, have to separately disclose income taxes paid for any jurisdiction where those income taxes paid are more than 5% of total income taxes paid. We did issue our exposure draft in March. Uh, our comment letters were due last week. We would still take your comments if you have them. Uh, we did receive about 56 comment letters so far. So we are looking forward to bringing that back to the board here in the near term from a redeliberation perspective. Uh, maybe next, just with regards to the accounting for crypto assets, probably not a topic that uh, you need a whole lot of introduction into. Uh, so I will just highlight that obviously this was an area we heard significant feedback through our agenda consultation process that entities that hold plain vanilla crypto assets and investors that are looking at crypto assets really didn't necessarily feel like the current accounting model, accounting for these crypto assets as intangible assets at a, a cost-less impairment model, was really reflective of the economic reality associated with those assets. So the board did hear that feedback through the agenda consultation process, and we did take on a project where the board has uh, required for certain crypto assets, and we do have specific scoping um, to kind of make this more in the, the plain vanilla space. Uh, but for certain crypto assets, those are required to be held at fair value with changes in fair value being recorded through net income each period. And from a disclosure perspective, since those crypto assets would be required to be accounted for at fair value, we already have extensive fair value disclosures in our fair value guidance. So those disclosures would be required as well as additional disclosures related to crypto assets to really help investors get a better understanding of what crypto assets are being held, what's the cost of those crypto assets, what's the fair value of those crypto assets, as well as a roll forward of the activity related to crypto assets each period. So we did issue that exposure draft in March and Rich mentioned comment letters are due today. I think we already have 50 some comment letters that have been received with regards to that. And certainly looking to bring that one back to the board here in the near term for redeliberations as well. One item, and I don't know if we've we've talked about the scope application of profits interest awards, uh, but just this is a project that had really come up more through our private company council and really related to guidance about how do you account for profits interests in similar awards. In other words, for these type of interests, these are interests that are, they're different than capital interests that are being provided to either employees or to service providers to really better align compensation with an entity's performance.
but different than other sort of capital interests. Uh, these holders would only participate in the future profits or equity appreciation. Um, so they don't really have those holders don't have rights to kind of the net assets of a partnership, for example. And the question comes up of should I be looking at that under the um, share based payment arrangement guidance or should I be looking at this more as a cash bonus or a profit sharing arrangement. Um, so these are more common in the private company space and this had come up as some diversity in practice that exists in the private company space. So coming through the private company council, they had highlighted this issue to the board. Um, the board also, through the staff research that was completed for the PCC, identified that these interests can also be issued by public companies. And so the PCC had recommended that the board take on this project so that we could address it for both a public company and a private company perspective. So the board had it has issued an exposure draft that would provide illustrative guidance to really help entities determine whether profits, interest, and similar awards should be accounted for under the share-based payment arrangement guidance. So again, this isn't one where we're changing the guidance. It's really just trying to provide some additional illustrative examples to help people apply the existing guidance that does exist today. Um, so that one, if you are interested in providing comments on it, we have issued that exposure draft in May and comments are due on July 10th. And lastly, just with regards to our final ASUs, and I won't go into these in detail because I think we've talked about these at, at our last meeting, uh, but we were able to finalize our guidance on common control leasing arrangements. Just want to highlight from an effective date perspective that those amendments are effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15th of 2023, including interim periods within those fiscal years, and early adoption is permitted for that standard and as well for the accounting for tax credit um, investments using the proportional amortization method. We were able to finalize that guidance. I wanna thank the EITF for their hard work with regards to that issue. And from an effective date perspective for public companies, that guidance is going to be effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15th of 2023 and interim periods within those years and all other entities will have one additional year from an effective date perspective. So that's kind of just a few additional details with regards to guidance that we issued in, in the course of the last quarter. Uh, but now I'll let Nellie give a little bit of a preview on a few other things that are coming down the pipeline. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So these couple things that I'm gonna talk about are projects where the board has finalized their deliberations or their re-deliberations as the case may be, and we're just working through the drafting process and expect the relevant document to be issued shortly. So first I'm gonna talk about acquired financial assets. Um, this was finalized by the board in March. Um, this project relates to the current expected credit loss model and the accounting for financial assets that are acquired either in an asset acquisition or a business combination. So first, let me explain a little bit about the current model just briefly in case, because it's helpful to understand what we're doing. So topic 326, the CECL model provides guidance about how to identify purchase financial assets with credit deterioration or PCD assets. Um, if they have experienced more than insignificant deterioration in credit quality since origination. So PCD assets and non-PCD assets are today accounted for differently under the CECL model in an, in an acquisition. So non-PCD assets have a day one credit loss expense recognized and PCD assets have an allowance recognized but then a gross up recognized to the amortized cost basis. So no day one loss for those. So since the CECL guidance was issued, the board has kind of been monitoring the, from, through the PIR process and heard a couple of things about this model. So specifically um, having two models, PCD and non-PCD is not intuitive and not consistently applied in terms of what falls into either model. And secondly, the non-PCD model, uh, investors told us that it, uh, the accounting doesn't make sense and isn't um, kind of unintuitive and difficult to understand. Um, so the board decided to expand the PCD model. The credit deterioration since origination will no longer be part of that evaluation. Um, instead, that gross up approach would be applied to all financial assets acquired in a business combination. And then in an asset acquisition, purchase financial assets would be identified on the basis of seasoning criteria. So uh, we've, we go into more detail in the guidance about what that, what that relates to. Um, this guidance does not change the recognition measurement presentation of PCD accounting or CECL. It's just this scoping issue around the PCD model, which was already also renamed, although I'm not using the new name. Um, 
and that is going to be the proposal is for that to be retrospectively applied to transactions that have occurred since the CECL uh, standard had been adopted. Mm -hmm. So that's going to expected to be issued for exposure this summer. And we look forward to all your comments on that. Uh, the other exposure, one of the other exposure drafts we expect to issue this summer is our disaggregation of income statement expenses project, with which you are likely familiar. Um, but just in case not, um, we've heard repeatedly over the years from investors that additional information about disaggregated expense information would be useful um, and helpful to their analysis, both to um, better understand an entity's cash flows and better compare an entity over time and to its peers. Um, so this project would require relevant income statement captions to be disaggregated into consistent natural categories, including inventory and manufacturing expense, employee compensation, depreciation, amortization, and DDNA. And then additional disaggregation would also be required for that inventory and manufacturing expense. Um, in that case, the disaggregation would be based on the costs incurred during the period with reconciling items to, to get back to the expense, but um, that's we can go into more detail about how that works. At a different time, um, we expect this exposure draft also to be um, issued this summer. Broadly, the board expects that as a result of this project, many entities will be disclosing more information about their expenses. And again, that this is gonna provide better comparability uh, through the consistent categories and a better ability to understand how an entity generates cash flows. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is joint venture formations. So this was uh, out for exposure last year. Comments were due in December. Um, and in April, the board completed its re-deliberations of this. So we expect this to go final probably also in the summer, maybe late summer timing. Um, broadly, again, this the request for guidance in this area came about because there's diversity in practice today because there's not clear guidance on how the accounting by the joint venture is done. Entities can either apply the cost basis of the entities of the assets or adjust to fair value in different circumstances. Um, and there's some interpretive guidance around that, but it's it leads to diversity in practice. So the board decided and affirmed in its redeliberations to require a new basis of accounting um, for several reasons, including but not limited to the formation of a joint venture re represents the creation of a new entity. So a new basis of accounting and remeasuring the assets and liabilities uh, makes sense and provides decision useful information at that juncture. Um, in the re-deliberations, the board did consider a few things that I'll highlight in case this is something that you had been following along. Some of these were, are places where we made changes and some of them the board did not, did not make changes. So first, as I mentioned, the board did affirm the requirement to measure the asset and liabilities at fair value. Um, this new basis of accounting might represent the, might result in the recognition of goodwill and the board decided not to limit that to when the assets are, when the assets being acquired represent a business, but to clarify that the board expects that if the assets and liabilities being acquired are not a business, the likelihood that there's goodwill in that transaction would be low. Um, the board also affirmed the way that the proposed amendments had discussed the formation date the formation date, which is the date that the assets and liabilities would be remeasured, is the date that the entity meets the definition of a joint venture. We that, that we talked about a number of different ways to think about that formation date. We got some feedback in the comment letters about how to think about that measurement date and the board affirmed the, the proposed amendments in that regard. And then lastly, the, what, the last one I'll highlight here, I guess, is that the proposed in the proposed amendments, the board had um, decided not to permit the joint venture to use a measurement period or to make measurement period adjustments like you would in a business combination. And we did receive feedback through the comment letter process that a measurement period would be useful um, and that entities would, would find that helpful to be able to apply this accounting. So the board decided to permit a measurement period um, in this new basis of accounting for joint ventures. Um, again, we're moving towards the issuance of a final standard later this summer for that one. Uh, there is one I wanna mention that's not on this slide. Um, and then I'll come back to the disclosure improvements that is on the slide, um, out of order. Um, we, are, we have a project on our agenda related to narrow scope improvements to interim reporting. Um, and this is something that's been on the agenda for some time and we did an exposure draft on this project in 2021, but we're continuing to work through this and hope to have a revised exposure draft later this year. Um, we, through the course of kind of re-deliberating the exposure draft, we've been able to kind of more clearly articulate and refresh what we're trying to do with this project. 
we think of this project as part of our responsibility to maintain the codification and make accounting guidance clear and, and understandable for our stakeholders. Broadly, we are not revisiting interim reporting holistically and we're not making any major changes to the level of disclosure required in interim periods. There could be clarifications, but nothing um, revisiting that in a broader way. We're tackling a, a few things as a, as a part of this project, a couple of which I'll highlight briefly. Um, first, we're clarifying how kind of the guidance on interim reporting is applied, and that will be relate to interim financial statements in accordance with GAAP. There's other information that entities, especially private entities, provide at interim periods, and we're going to be clarifying the distinction that that's not what's being addressed as a, as a result of this project. Um, next, we're um, incorporating a disclosure principle into Topic 270, which is actually based on uh, language that's from Regulation SX Rule 1001 um, about when disclosure is provided in an interim period and kind of what that represents. And then lastly, and perhaps most significantly, well, maybe not most significantly, but we're going to see if we can clarify which disclosure requirements in the codification are interim requirements. Over the years, we have not been consistent in the language that we use when identifying whether a requirement is to be made on an interim basis or a comparable basis or both. So we, the team and the board are going through every disclosure requirement in the codification in every topic. This is over 900 disclosure requirements and it is extensive and also very fun. And uh, we are gonna be hopefully able to be a little bit more clear about that. Look, I, I understand it might be fun to a limited audience, but I didn't say that. Um, Again, we're, we're moving towards a revised exposure draft on this topic, so more to come there. Um, I might pause there for questions on any of these or observations. Quick, quick, quick question. Sure. Um, on Cecil, just to clarify, um, it will be retrospectively applied to for acquisitions that have occurred since Cecil's adoption, so that you would have to restate the financial statements to factor that factor those acquisitions in is that correct? that's right that's the board's okay. decision for okay. the exposure period and we'll see what kind of feedback we get in the common letter period okay and um the exposure draft is the summer and that, that's right so the time horizon would be like how would that uh i can't remember i think the comment period is 90 days okay so by by summer i think i mean more precisely the end of june or maybe like early july And I think the comment letter period might actually be 60 or 75 days. We just oh, have thank to, you. Sorry, we've been issuing a number of exposure clarifying. drafts recently, but um, we'll clarify that. But I think that the hope would be that we're issuing that, if not by the end of the month, very shortly thereafter, and then looking for feedback during the third quarter and then bringing it back to the board shortly thereafter. Thank you. I shouldn't have guessed. Um, okay. Anything else on any of those? Okay, if not, I'm going to cover duster uh, with a longer title that I'm not going to bother saying, but um, on our next slide, we've got some more details on this. Um, this project also has been on our agenda for a number of years, um, but uh, last month the board voted to move to a final ASU, so it seemed like the right time to give you an update on this project. Um, before I go into more our more recent discussions, let me go back to the beginning. This actually originates from in 2018, the SEC referred a list of disclosures to the FASB. The SEC was making amendments and changes to some of their disclosures and decided that they wanted the board to consider these items and kind of through the standard setting process, evaluate whether these disclosure requirements should be incorporated into GAAP. Um, at the time they made that referral, the SEC did not change or remove these disclosures from the SEC's guidance. So they all still exist in SEC guidance. Um, and in the, the request was for us to, again, take this into consideration as part of the standard setting process, which we did. We added a project to the agenda in 2019 and issued an exposure draft. Um, and in total, the SEC had referred 27 disclosures to us and that 2019 exposure draft had 19 of them. So there was a group that the board decide, did not expose at that time. A couple of them were referred to other projects and a few the board decided not to incorporate. Um, Generally, the disclosures referred are relatively narrow items. Um, I think it might be easier to understand kind of what this is getting at if I just describe a couple of these, not all 27, I promise. Um, so one disclosure relates to the methods used for an earnings per share calculation that any would disclose the method used for its earning per, earnings per share calculation and that the board proposed incorporating that into the earnings per share guidance in topic 260. 
As another example, there's a disclosure of assets mortgaged, pledged, or otherwise subject to lien and the obligations that are collateralized by those assets. Um, so that was when the board proposed incorporating into the guidance on commitments. And then just as a third example, five of the disclosures relate to repurchase agreements and reverse repurchase agreements, including the interest rate on uh, repurchase liabilities. Um, so those are incorporated into the guidance on transfers and servicing in topic 860. Um, again, they're, they're relatively narrow items. They're all currently in SEC guidance. So we would not anticipate any major changes for public companies in, in looking through this. Um, last month, the board re-deliberated this proposed ASU from 2019. We had gotten 16 comment letters. Broadly, the comment letter feedback was very positive about incorporating this into GAP, hoping that that would be more consistent, um, you know, kind of one-stop shop for, for GAP disclosures. Um, the comment letter feedback did give us a lot of feedback on specific disclosures, which I won't go through. Um, the board has decided for 14 of those disclosures that they will be incorporated into GAP. Um, you'll have to trust my math that this all works out. It's on the slide uh, as well. Um, and then now I have to explain the effective date, which is a little different than we're used to seeing uh, here. So as I mentioned, when the disclosures were referred to the FASB, they were not removed from the SEC's guidance at that time. Um, the SEC asked us to look at it and then said they would come back to consider that uh, after the board has decided what to do. So the board does not want to duplicate disclosures between GAP and the SEC's requirement. And in addition, we the intent of the disclosures is the, is the same, but in some cases, the wording is not exact between what got incorporated into GAP and what's remaining in the SEC literature. So we don't want to create interpretive challenges or confusion there. So the board decided that for each disclosure that will be added to GAP, it will become effective for entities that are currently providing that disclosure under the SEC regulations on the date that it becomes final that the SEC removes that from its requirements. Um, so that determination, as I mentioned, is gonna be made on an individual disclosure basis. So in, if the SEC were to do that in a couple pieces, they would be effective for gap purposes when they're removed from the SEC's guidance. And in addition, if there's any disclosures that are not removed by June 30th of 2027, those will not go effective. Um, that pending content would be removed from the codification and the board could revisit this or push that date out if it's you know about to come to be final or something like that. But that's just so that we don't have pending content sitting in the codification for a longer period of time without an excuse to revisit it. Um, we call that this kind of backstop or sunset date for these types of amendments, and they will be applied prospectively. So that's the update on Duster. Um, so uh, any questions or, or comments on that? All right, then I think we can close out uh, this section with regards to our, uh, we just wanted to give you a highlight of other topics that are on our agenda. So if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, on our conceptual framework, I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of the fact that we have completed our re-deliberations with regards to our concept statement uh, chapter related to reporting entity. And we do expect to issue a final concept statement here in the next month or so. We've also completed our re-deliberations with regards to our concept statement chapter related to recognition and de-recognition. And hopefully we'll be able to issue that final concept statement chapter in the third quarter. And importantly, we have begun our re-deliberations with, re or re-begun our deliberations with regards to our measurement chapter. And we do expect to issue a, uh, expose a concept statement chapter later this year with regards to measurement. Um, now, the reason we're really excited about this is that these three concept statement chapters really represent the remaining parts of the concept statements that we started to put in place in the 1980s and we haven't quite finished yet. So the fact that we could be finishing the concept statement is a really exciting item here around the FASB. And um, so we're really looking forward to getting those through the progress and really thankful for everyone who's provided us feedback with regards to our exposure drafts on the concept statements as well. And then lastly, with regards to our research agenda, I think we've talked about the fact that our research agenda is different and that that is controlled by the FASB chair. So Rich has the ability to add projects and remove projects from the research agenda. 
but we really do use that research agenda in a way for us to be able to do the research kind of behind the scenes, to look at certain topics that we've heard interest in, and to see if there's really a project there that we think is going to meet the agenda criteria such that a majority of the board would want to add that to the technical agenda. Um, so the research projects are really important to us. We have them all staffed and they're all being worked on. Um, I did want to highlight just a couple of these are areas that I would expect that you would hear about here in the next couple of, uh, at least next quarter or the following quarter. I would imagine we'd be coming back to talk to the board with regards to the accounting for commodities, the accounting for government grants, which we had issued an invitation to comment on last year, as well as on definition of a derivative that you all provided a lot of great feedback on at our last FASAC meeting. Um, so certainly those are ones I wanted to highlight that you may see more us talking about in the near term, but we are actively working on the remainder of those uh, research projects. So I know a lot of you have already been involved in outreach with regards to those projects and I want to say thank you for that. And also thank you for answering the phone in the future as we continue to call you on those research projects. And um, so we just wanted to give you a little bit of a highlight of what to expect from the research agenda as well. And then lastly, we just have a bullet here with regards to agenda consultation refresh. And this is really just to highlight that you can see we are moving through our agenda uh, effectively. And I think that's based on a lot of the feedback that we received through the agenda consultation process. And we may be in a position to be asking for your help again for thinking about what are those financial reporting issues that should be rising to the level of priority for the board to address. So that's something that I think may be coming in the future, probably not this year, but next year. So certainly something that would be coming back to FACE Act to be discussed in the future as well. All right. With that, I'll turn it over to sure, Alicia. Sure. Questions for Hoey or Noe? Thanks again. Always uh, impressed with how much you have on the plate at any one point in time and keep it forward. It's exciting about the concepts. I know you've been working on that for a while, so that's great. Um, I'll take this last slide, which has to do with the uh, recent trustees meeting. I, I attend, you might be aware that I attend trustees meetings to report and part of what FASAC is doing, but also uh, get to observe other portions of it. And the trustees, I would say, uh, are continuing to be committed to enhancing their transparency and accountability to the public and the uh, people that rely on them and on us as uh, standard setters or people that assist standard setters. So first off, the um, oversight Committee, which is the group that oversees the FASB and the GASB and their standard setting process, um, announced that they're going to live stream and make public uh, certain portions of their meetings in the future. Um, again, in the mode of just uh, giving folks a little more insight into the process uh, and um, transparency. And then they also implemented a procedure with respect to um, any alleged failures of the FASB or GASB to follow their due process is set forward in their bylaws. So the bylaws have a host of standards in terms of meeting uh, format, meetings being public, members being appointed, new members, et cetera. There's a whole host of bylaws. In effect, this creates uh, this similar to an ombudsman where someone uh, who believed that those procedures weren't being followed appropriately would have a way to access uh, the trustees to uh, to put forth any uh, observations they had in that regard. So that's uh, another thing. And as they, again, just consistent with trying to uh, in, uh, reinforce that they understand their accountability to the public. So we'll come back to FACE Act membership in a second. Um, but as we wrap up here, a couple of things. One is um, Emma, Emma Gao, who's been uh, our PTA, of late is off to the next step of her career, going to work uh, for EY in Atlanta. But uh, Emma, I've really enjoyed work working with you. And I think we've all benefited from the hard work that she's done behind the scenes. And uh, she will be missed, but she's going down to Atlanta to be close to her UGA football team, which we know she supports so much. So uh, she's just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, our next meeting is going to be Thursday, September 21st here at the FASB offices. And then um, getting back to the nominations and the membership, always important. Summer's the time when we kick off that process. Um, looking as always for candidates in a variety of roles and backgrounds, but that includes preparers, investors, other financial statement users, academics, we'll have to have a practitioner from a regional firm and a member of corporate boards, audit committees um, always would be helpful. And, you know, as uh, 
anyone has suggestions and always looking for diversity in the background and perspective, I think that's what gives this group its uh, its power, if you will. So um, you know, feel free to pass those along to us. Um, the nice thing is we have a good pi pipeline, but you can never have a strong enough pipeline in that regard. So uh, thanks to everyone. And unless there's any other questions and comments, would um, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Good day.